you know it's this. Take a perk and it's hook and it's see. Money slowly like six. Did it perfect in the kid. Got a feeling I'm single, my hate enough to better put on the road. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil is eating that shit with a game. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the tenth part of What If Deku Helps His Best Friend, Peter Parker. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Katsuki stretched in front of his locker, doing some last-minute pillates and exercises. He calmed himself, hoping the mic teacher would just announce the fight and get this over with. They had five more minutes until the next match, given that some of the arena got damaged by Punk Chick during her fight with Frog. The blonde bomber looked back as he stretched his arms, seeing Horn Girl doing some leg work. She performed some rapid squats up and down before taking a swig of water and closing her locker. Her blue eyes turned, and Sky Blue met Ruby. Huh, Horn Girl really thought she had a shot against him. Fat chance, but she got this far, and rushing and half-cocked already gave one more win to Deku than he deserved. This far into the festival, Katsuki couldn't afford to make that kind of mistake. He remembered during the race, how fast she was riding her horns over the minefield. If he remembered right, she'd probably take to the skies, try and get some advantage over his explosion. From there, Katsuki could only guess, but it would leave her without a set of horns to defend against him for the first few seconds. Above him, sirens blared, the loudmouth teacher getting the crowd ready for the next fight. He scoffed at Horn Girl's glare as he shut his locker and walked out the door, giving only a single glance back to confirm that she was coming out. All that mattered right now was to win. Katsuki saw the TVs on the ceiling showing highlights, bottom scrolls, and social media feeds of the sports festival. Once he beat her, he'd be one step closer to facing Parker if he didn't fuck up against Vinegar. Although, Katsuki couldn't contain a soft chuckle and a smirk. The prospect of either besting Icy Hot or blasting Deku to the moon in the next round was incredibly tantalizing. He felt his quirk pop and simmer under the surface as his expression shifted back to a stoic visage. The roar of the crowd came forth as the two walked out together into the stadium, the hype of the start of the second round boiling over. All right and we are back. We have a big contrast in styles and power, but this match may prove to be one of the more interesting ones yet to start off our second round slate. Present Mike boomed as the two walked up to the arena. It is also our second in Hero Course class clashes. Class 1A vs 1B. Katsuki took his side of the field, as Horn Girl took hers. He glared, narrowing her eyes. Most people tended to falter or wilt with his intimidation. Always useful for getting an edge. All Horn Girl did was glare back, hands at her sides as her blue eyes focused on him. They turned to the side, and Katsuki followed her gaze. In the class one a box, Parker was cheering, and he could make out her name being called. The blonde rolled his eyes and focused on his opponent as present Mike finished his little hype speech. Katsuki knelt down, both hands behind him and ready to turbo rush her. A quick and fast ring out and Horn Girl got down on all fours in a sprinter's position, her horns vibrating as she looked up at him. Katsuki could feel a rush down his spine. Anticipation. The thrill of battle coursing through his veins. Birdbrain was nothing but a walk in the park. This would be his real warm-up in preparation for Deku or Icy Hot as the real challenge. From there, come what may, he was standing on that podium with a number one around his neck. In all likelihood, either Parker or Vinegar will be his last obstacle. I will be the one closest to All Might when all is said and done. No one else. His gaze went to the stands, narrowing at a certain American. And certainly not you. Both fighters are ready and set. Midnight declared from her perch, Katsuki's gaze of steel meeting Horngirl's iron glare. Begin. Katsuki took off, explosions blasting off behind him while Horn Girl's horns detached as she ran. She got onto her horns and Katsuki saw his target. Take out the horns. Remove her aerial capabilities. He lashed his hand out, grunting as he blasted, only for Horn Girl to leap over his blast, sacrificing her horns. Katsuki didn't bother looking back, employing Turbo again and avoiding two horns clattering off the ground where he once stood. He pivoted on the spot and blasted off as he saw the girl land on a new set of horns, new ones taking their place. She could fly, yet in terms of breakneck speed over short distances, explosions were unrivaled. Katsuki bared his teeth, leading with his right hand. Horn Girl gaped in surprise at his speed as he released, firing an explosive blast point blank. Before he could feel comfortable, he felt two horns slam their flat edges against him and push him back. The same move she used against Orange. Katsuki yelled, twisting and contorting his body and speeding up his corkscrew motion with his explosion, 
destroying the horns in the process. Not all that tough, they're more like hardened fingernails than ivory. But they have mass, Katsuki thought as he landed, seeing the smoke fade as horn girl stood standing, singed in her UA. Uniform in tatters, but nonetheless undaunted. She lowered her head, and fired another duo of horns. Katsuki blasted off, glaring at her as he remained silent, charging for her as he reared back his right hand, destroying the projectiles and continuing his turbo rush towards her. He made it through the smoke, swiping with his left hand at the spot where Horn Girl was. His explosive blast caught nothing but air. Huh? Katsuki uttered before he felt his stomach get slammed by something hard. The boy gasped and coughed as he was knocked off his feet by a double hoof kick, grunting as he landed and skidded on the ground. He got back on his feet using his explosion to propel him up. Right on time too, as two horns zoomed past where he was lying down. He landed, glaring hard at the girl as she regrew another pair her hooves padding against the ground akin to an enraged bull. All she did was glare back, nostrils flaring. She got me with that. He rubbed his stomach, wincing in pain. That shot would definitely leave a bruise. After a moment, the crowd erupted in a jubilant roar. Katsuki narrowed his eyes. For all flying her horns give her, she's got some pretty shit maneuverability. He aimed his hands, avoiding another pair of horns as he dashed to the side. She can only use two, that's her max before she starts losing it and one good hit on her, and she's done. Horn Girl looked at him, eyes hard and set as Katsuki gritted his teeth. She wasn't backing down. Perhaps her style wasn't well matched against Icy Hot and more against someone like him. Huh? Was that idea going through her head, giving her confidence? Time to show her where she belonged on the totem pole. Come and get me, Hafu, Katsuki uttered, and Horn Girl fired two horns at him, making him dodge to the right. He looked down, seeing her land on another set of horns as he narrowed his eyes, not grinning even though he felt satisfaction rush through his being. She'd taken the bait. This was going to end poorly. Shouta watched as the two students circled one another, both of them probing the capabilities of the other with long-range shots. Surprisingly Bekugo was the one on the defensive, using explosive bursts to defend against Tsunotori's horn missiles. He'd been keeping his quirk toned down, limiting his shots until the right moment. Bakugo was looking towards the other potential fights, yet every bit of his attention was focused on his opponent. The first opponent that had given her the attention that she deserved. Present Mike barely talked about her contributions in the war during the break's rundown, but she had still earned second place in the obstacle course. No matter what people thought she looked like she was no China doll, she'd earned her place here. And unlike her class representative, Bakugo would have no reservations against using his all if she forced his hand. Right now, it seemed to Shouta that Bakugo was only using as much as he thought he needed. It could cost him later, but it gave him an advantage if he needed to ramp up. The second of surprise that would come with seeing Bakugo's true capacity would be more than enough to earn the Berserker a victory. However, watching Bakugo's blast hit a little too close for Mike's liking if his wince was anything to go by. Combining the nature of his quirk with the stubbornness that the girl has been showing since the final started. He turned his gaze to the stands, where a certain loudmouth student was literally on the edge of his seat. Shouta turned back to Beck Hugo. The boy knew what was at stake. He was paying attention when Shouta explained the importance of the festival. But, even if Bakugo was giving his opponent the respect she deserved, the black-haired man remembered the first battle trial E when he fought Midoriya. He would stop this match, faster than the refs could if he needed to. It was strange. Running around, firing her horns under the sun, the heat biting at her skin. It almost felt like home, except, the ranch never had this many people visit. And the heat came from the fiery explosions, not the sun. Pony dug her hooves into the ground, but a blast lit up her vision. Heat and air sent her tumbling back. Blinking the stars out of her eyes, Pony dragged herself to her feet, her horns at the ready, only for another blast to snipe her horns out from over her head. Superheated air slammed into her face, throwing her back to the ground. Her vision swirled as her head hit the concrete. Her arms felt sluggish, but they managed to find the ground beneath her and push her back up. If you're just gonna lay there, you can hurry up and die. Instinct flared through her, her hooves finding purchase and flinging her to the side. Pony felt her right side light up with the heat, and she barely managed to stop herself from going over the arena's edge. She looked up, the great flaming torch greeting her as her eyes focused. Ignoring the pain, she dragged herself back to all fours, glaring back at her opponent. Despite that early hit, Bakugo didn't even look winded as he threw those bombs her way. He probably could do a whole lot better. He'd turned that zero pointer's head to nothing earlier today. Even so, I'm not done yet. Bakugo scoffed. Good, cause crying uncle at this point wouldn't do you any good. 
She launched a horn at him, only for him to blast it away with one hand and fling an explosive wave her way with the other. Pony launched herself into the air, catching herself with her horns. Bakugo's glare followed her every inch as she ascended. I know, but heroes don't back down. I'm not, and Peter. Bakugo's eyes narrowed. Oh give me a break. He brought his hands together, and unleashed a ball of fire that went under her. Pony barely had time to wonder why before the shot went critical on the concrete below her, pelting her with rocks and hot air, causing her to fall the small distance to the ground. It was only about six feet, but she hit hard, scraping her side and making her arm burn against the ground. She seethed, groaning in pain. Parker this and Parker that, is everyone part of his fucking fan club or something? The foreigner gets a cool suit, which he then loses for being weak, throws a few pathetic one-liners, treats this entire sports festival like a goddamn joke, and I'm just supposed to accept that his joking ass is supposed to be number one. The closest one to all might. I refuse that. Pony winced as she tried to move her arm, but she could deal with it. Rising once again, Pony found herself the target of Bakugo's burning glare. Only, it was even angrier as he marched towards her. Wake the fuck up. He's not the one fighting here, so quit thinking of him and fucking focus on what you're here for. He snarled. You're strong and capable. So get back up and fight for yourself and no one else, you stupid cow. Pony's eyes narrowed, her teeth bared. They were standing in the middle of the arena now. She charged. Just get him a little closer, and I got him. She thought to herself as she darted forward, low to the ground, horns still in her head and at the ready. Bakugo shifted into a stance as he reared back his right hand. She got in close and sidestepped left, firing only to get a quick blast to the face for her troubles. Pony yelled, rolling across the ground before recovering, ignoring the pain in her body. Not yet. She regrew her horns and charged again, Pony focusing on the smoke and debris. She saw a hand, and she fired. A horn missed, but she heard Bakugo grunt from getting nicked. Die. And Pony's world spun with the force of another blast. She skidded across the hard floor, getting back up onto all fours. Her blonde hair was in tatters, burns and bruises all across her body as she yelled like a berserker. She wasn't going to lose like this. Bakugo saw her approach as he swung his arm, getting rid of the dust and debris that she charged straight through. Fast as she could, she conjured two horns, and they spun around her back, another set sprouting out of her head. Bakugo aimed his hands and Pony fired, going right. Two thunderous blasts rang out, destroying the horns and Pony covered her face as the heat and dust made her ears ring. But she charged regardless. He hadn't moved. Pony pounced, leading with her head as Bakugo sidestepped her charge. Her horns grazed his shirt, tearing it as she ducked a potential right-handed swipe. She kicked upwards, the blonde avoiding a thrusting hoof. Just die already. Bakugo roared. Pony saw him aim down as she smirked. With a crackling ember, a flaming horn that had been hiding behind the brazier to the corner of the arena slammed into Bakugo's back, catching him completely off guard and missing his right-handed strike. Bakugo yelled in pain at the searing hot projectile, twirling around to destroy the horn, only to get a double hoof kick to the head for his troubles as Pony pushed up with her arms, her horns firing into the ground to give her extra propulsion, saliva and sweat blasting off his head like a boxer getting sucker punched. Bakugo staggered, eyes unfocused as Pony regrouped and charged. He raised his right hand to stop her advance out of instinct. The other burning horn slammed into his hand, redirecting it as he howled in agony from the searing hot strike, before being tackled by the Texan in the gut. They tumbled to the ground as Pony got behind him. She brought her arms to his neck, bringing him to a rear naked chokehold as she squeezed, her muscular horse-like legs pinning Bakugo's down. She didn't hear the gasp of the audience or the cry of present Mike. All she focused on was the wind, baring her teeth as she pulled on her arm around Beck Hugo's neck. Just needed to make him pass out or tap out. Papa had done this with pigs and villains many a time back home after all. Beck Hugo gasped, his fingers clawing and scraping at her arm that betrayed just how muscular she was under her seemingly cute and delicate frame. Pony tugged tighter. Pass out, damn it. He grabbed her arm and fired off explosions like firecrackers. The blonde girl screamed in pain, only making her squeeze harder. She heard the blonde bomber struggle and writhe as they tussled on the ground, the concrete scraping her and making her bleed as blood poured down her head. Beck Hugo brought his hands down beside him, and with the gasping roar of an animal being crushed under jaws of a predator, Pony yelped as he fired a full blast gauntlet-less explosion at her sides, causing a violent eruption in the center of the arena. 
pony, Parker yelled, hands on the sweet's rail, stood up with widened eyes as he saw Kakin set off a detonation akin to those ones he used during the war. So close to the ground and so close to her. Amazing. She had Kakin beaten. Izuku's jaw was on the floor, not even writing as his eyes were transfixed on the fight while the smoke and dust cleared. Even the Class 1B suite which had been cheering went silent. Does Class 1B have that strong of a student? Asui asked in utter bewilderment. How the hell do you Americans get so strong? Maijiro asked with wide eyes, looking back to Peter before his gaze returned to the arena. The dust began to clear. Kakin had always been a symbol of victory in his life. There was nothing Kakin couldn't overcome or excel at from what Izuku had seen. From fighting off bullies when they were super young and not even shedding a tear, to becoming the honor student at Alderna with perfect marks across the board, Kakin hadn't been challenged and yet, here at UA, he'd never seen his childhood friend pushed to the brink like this. Izuku was bewildered. He'd looked like he was about to lose before he used a gauntlet-less blast on the ground beside him to escape Tsunotori's hold. Looking over, he saw Peter gripping the rail, eyes wide and face filled with dread as his hands were, twisting the rail. Mimiri's jaw was slack, her hand gripping her bullwhip as she saw the fight before her. In terms of power, Bakugo was superior. Yet the most fundamental lesson of being a hero wasn't always about the most powerful quirk. It was in how it was used and by God did Tsunotori use her horns and her bovine. Equine physiology to the fullest extent of her abilities. Before them, Tsunotori was on all fours, in her sports bra as her blue UA. Shirt was in utter tatters and shreds, hair hanging from her locks as she panted, arms and legs shaking to hold her up as she was on her feet, and hands. Before her, Bakugo was on his knees, but gasping and breathing hard, his blue UA. Shirt likewise in tatters as he was covered in burns and bruises. The price to pay to get out of the American submission chokehold. Cementos is on the edge of his seat, hands gripping the armrests, to call the fight if need be. The two stared long at each other, blood running down their crowns as they panted. Bakugo rose first, wincing and seething as Tsunotori did the same. Nimiri saw her look to the stands, towards her suite, or at least the general area, and the pro-heroine could see Tsunotori's eyes moisten up. She said something, Nimiri couldn't catch it. Tsunotori lost her footing, collapsing onto the ground in a heap as Bakugo stood up. Panting even as he was drenched in sweat and blood, bruised and battered as his arms shook in pain. Cementos took to the field, going to her as he sprinted and checked Pony's fallen form. The audience gasped and muttered. He knelt down, putting a hand to her neck and nodding, giving her a thumbs up as he waved his arms for the medical bots. All right then, Tsunotori is unable to continue. She raised her bullwhip. Bakugo wins. The crowd roared, cheers erupting as Bakugo just stood there, panting with wide eyes as the medical bots took her. He walked over, seeing her being placed on a stretcher as he gazed at her, almost in awe before he wiped his head of blood. His stoic visage came back as he exhaled as he put his hands in his pockets, walking back to the tunnel. W-O-O-W. What a match. That was the match of the tournament right here. What a way to start the second round. Pony Tsunotori threw everything and the kitchen sink at Bakugo Katsuki, but came up just short. We are going to be remembering that fight for a long time. Yes, those two will make fine pros someday, if they can get there that is, Aizawa added, and Nimiri couldn't help but agree. Even if Tsunotori had lost the fight, gazing up to the stands and seeing many a pro hero in attendance whispering to themselves alongside the talent scouts, she and Bakugo had certainly left an impression. She was concerned at first, since Tsunotori was a sweet girl. But the sports festival paved a way to a Tsunotori she did not know or expect, with her performance during the race, and now this. And Bakugo himself did well showing restraint only until he was pushed, yet not too much to insult her either. He'd taken her seriously for a time, but Pony was able to get the drop on him, forcing him into a corner. He suffered burns and bruises galore from using his own quirk on himself, but it helped him get out of that chokehold lest he pass out. Mimiri knew a thing or two about asphyxiation after all. Bakugo had been close too, and that Tsunotori girl knew her stuff. Seeing Bakugo march off to the tunnel, Nimiri allowed herself a soft smile. Surly and harsh he may be, but the boy wasn't joking when he said he wanted to be the best. It was as Aizawa said. Those two are going to become fine pros indeed. A pro hero in training. Bakugo Katsuki. Those words made Peter sick as he stood ramrod straight, his hands on the railing, clenching his jaw as he watched his classmate walk back to the tunnel. Pony deserved to win. She should have gotten the win. She was so, so close. Bakugo is here to win, just like everyone but yet. 
to fire explosions of that ferocity, even damaging himself. How far would he go for victory, even against a peer? Actually, that last one shouldn't even be a surprise the more Peter realized it. Not with the battle trial, not with the USJ. Peter Sam. He turned, Momo gazing up at him in concern. I'm sorry that your friend didn't win. Are you Oka? I'm good, he said quickly, just frustrated is all. Momo nodded slowly, though she didn't exactly look okay with the match either. Between him and watching Pony get wheeled away, everyone seemed uncomfortable. Taking a deep breath, he jerked his head towards the door. I need to use the restroom, he uttered softly under his breath, tense as he walked past as the other students who pulled in their legs to give Peter a way out. Parker-san, are you s Peter rounded, seeing Midoriya standing up in concern, trailing off as Peter stared back, staring into those green orbs. He could see Midoriya's eyes widen, but right now, Peter didn't care. Restroom, he hissed before finally leaving the suite. Pro hero in training, Bakugo Katsuki, no one should ever have to pull that kind of stunt in an arena. Cementa should have called the fight. Not that Pony didn't hold her own, she did amazing. Just, there was a limit. He walked through the halls, with only his thoughts to himself as he went to the locker room. He heard footsteps behind him, seeing Todoroki following him, with Midoriya close behind. That's right, their match was up next. He needed time to himself, and to check on his first friend. Peter continued to walk through those halls, meandering as the words and sight of the fight replayed in his head, eventually finding the infirmary. He knocked, taking a deep breath. Come in, recovery girl said from within. Peter walked inside, seeing Pony in one of the beds and breathing softly. Several medical bots were close by, as were some ta nurses busy cleaning and dabbing Pony's injuries. Is there something you need? Parker Sam, she asked, looking up as Peter walked in. He glanced at the healer before returning his gaze to Pony, idly noting that another bed had canvas wrapped around it off to the side. How is she? He asked, the anger dissipating as Pony groaned. She was covered in medical patches and had two IVs in her. She'll be all right. The girl has a lot of vigor to her, so the healing will be done within the hour. The old nurse stated. She will need to rest and fill up on fluids, of course. P. Dot 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 ter groaned out the blonde as Peter took his place beside her, pulling up a chair. He allowed a smile to come forth. Hey, Tony. The brown-haired boy tried smiling, seeing the girl open her eyes and look back at him, her chest rising and falling as she breathed. Pony closed her eyes. Sorry, I couldn't win. She groaned, and Peter shook his head. I it's okay Pony. I mean, you kicked so much ass. Peter said in English, grinning wide. I mean, wow. You were so strong out there. You were kicking his ass. Left and right. He felt his heart clench, but it was true. Pony gave it her all out there, even outsmarting that. That thug and she had almost claimed a well-deserved victory in her hands. I know. Pony took a deep breath. I still lost though. I, I wanted to win so badly. She closed her mouth, biting her lip as she fought back tears. Hi, hey, easy. Peter patted her head, and Pony's eyes widened. You'll get him next year, okay? We'll both get stronger. The blonde's jaw was ajar as she closed her eyes, before she finally smiled. Yeah, we will. Together. Is that all? Tsunotori needs her rest. Recovery girl stated from her chair, walking over as the ta nurses stepped aside. Peter looked back and nodded. Okay. He stood back up. Thank you. Just doing my duty. Do you wish to speak to your classmate as well? The temperature dropped as Peter focused his gaze on the canvas bed. From the corner, he could see Bekugo looking out from an open slot in the canvas. Red eyes met brown as they glared back before Peter walked to the door, seeing Pony drift to sleep after Recovery Girl gave her a big smooch. He'll live, he uttered, closing the door and marching down the hallway sternly. Peter saw All Might marching past in his gaudy-looking yellow pinstripe suit. Ah, uh, young Parker, how do you do? He trailed off, seeing the demeanor that the American was emitting, eyes as hard as steel. Fine, Peter uttered, walking past and not giving the number one hero a second glance. He would always be thankful for his words after the USJ incident. He'd been an upstanding, great hero. He is the symbol of peace for all in this world. Peter's eyes hardened as he walked down the lonely hallway. This sports festival was supposed to be a game. Guess he was wrong. That Hugo has always been an asshole ever since they met in that elevator a month ago. Then the USJ. Now this. Peter breathed hard through his nose, nothing but the empty hallway to stew in his thoughts. Izuku was still trying to process it all as he walked out of the suite hopefully he doesn't encounter Parker, given that look in his eyes. He was somber back during the speech. After Tsunotori's fight, he looked like he was hiding his anger, albeit barely. Still, to think that Kaken was pushed to such a limit. Never in his entire life has he seen him come so close to losing. Yet in the end, Kaken managed to win out by force of will. 
even though Tsuno Tori got in some really good hits that probably even caught his childhood friend by surprise. Those explosions took its toll on her. She was only human after all, yet so was Kaken as well. Everyone's trying their best, going plus ultra. Tsuno Tori has been doing so all day with her performance at the race. Izuku looked down at his hands, seeing the scars of his long hard year of training along with the times he saved others using all for one at 100%. Parker, Shozaki, Tsunotori, Kaken, all of them have stood out as amongst the best of the best. I've got my quirk under control but, have I really stated I am here to the world? Izuku thought, gripping his fist. I have to make an impact. Here and now, he raised his head, looking dead ahead. I need to win, to make my declaration. All Might is expecting me and, hey kid, came a gruff voice, and Izuku jumped, suddenly feeling very warm as he turned. He was greeted with the imposing and towering form of the number two hero in the country. The flame hero Endeavor. Ogos the number two hero. He's right there. Izuku's jaw gaped as he asked you waked out his name. The Endev. I found you. Getting ready for your match. Endeavor asked, his green eyes boring down at him. It was like being close to a bonfire Izuku was beginning to sweat. He gulped lightly, gazing up at him. He's only seen him on TV but... He's so intimidating up close. He endeavor sir. I I know you're working security. On a R round, Izuku squeaked out. The flame hero crossed his arms. In a way, I have to say, that quirk of yours. It reminds me of All Might's in a way, albeit far weaker. Endeavor spoke aloud, and Izuku's heart clenched. However, that Hafu girl who fought the Bakugo kid had a plain quirk. Yet she was able to go beyond and push him to brink of defeat. But, going by the power and speed you displayed during the race and that war of the flags, Endeavor pointed down at him, and Izuku never felt so small. You have talent and a head on your shoulders, so I admit you have potential to be good someday soon. And going by that smash you yelled during the war, you must be quite the fan of All Might aren't you? He asked, and the green-haired boy's blood went cold. He didn't tell anyone. Wait, did Todoroki tell no? He and Todoroki aren't on good terms. He wants to spite him, so why the comparison? What was he getting at? Izuku shook his head. No, he can't focus on such things. He'll bring it up with All Might after the fight with Todoroki. For now, one match at a time. I appreciate your time tea talking to me sir, but my match is Izuku saw an arm pressed against the wall, and Endeavor loomed over him. In his way, my son, Shoto, he is your opponent in the next fight. He has a very valuable responsibility placed upon him, bestowed by me. He growled, leering down as Izuku as his emerald eyes burned like embers, and that is to surpass All Might in every way. This fight will prove to be most valuable. Endeavor oiled before a chuckle came out. Besides, the boy's true potential can only be brought out with adversity. You and your classmate did so before after all. Izuku stopped, feeling the flame hero pat his shoulder. I saw his actions in the last minutes of the war. You also drew out the fire within him. He can tell that the older man was smirking down like a cat preying upon a mouse. Izuku's brain worked, remembering the highlights. That's right, Todoroki used a bit of fire to repel Parker. Do put on a good show and give it all you got. He smirked. Make him struggle and test him. Only you and Parker have the potential to make him grow out of his stupid rebellious phase. He even chuckled lightly. Hell, if you put on a good showing, I may even extend you an invitation to intern my firm young man. Izuku was frozen on the spot as Endeavor pulled back his hand, finally realizing after meeting Todoroki's father, just how callous and cold he was despite the heat and fire he emitted. In short, the plan was for me to never use my left side, to be a hero using only my right, to spite that monster who calls himself my father. Todoroki Shoto looked up, eyes burning with a controlled and focused rage. I will deny him the pleasure of trying to live through me, and I will get to the top using only my eyes. And yet, both you and Peter Parker made me break that vow out of instinct. He scoffed. I bet he's laughing right now. But no more. Those times were just aberrations. Midoriya Izuku, you're strong. You keep getting stronger too, I admit that. Izuku eyes widened, heart skipping. That's why I want to beat you and beat the best in this class. Peter Parker, I will surpass you both. Don't you forget that. Those eyes Todoroki had. They were so angry, so clouded. In a way, they were just like endeavors, driven by ambition and desire for a goal, even if it forsakes others or even themselves, in a path towards self-destruction. Endeavor failed to surpass All Might. Now he is living through Todoroki to accomplish what he could not. I apologize for my bluntness. I thank you for hearing me out. Endeavor walked past the green-haired boy, his footsteps in echoing the hall. Mr. Endeavor, sir. He spoke out, and he heard the pro hero stop in his tracks. I, I am not all might. Well, obviously. Endeavor replied with a roll of his eyes judging by his tone. You're, and neither is Parker-san. 
He's not all might either. None of us are our mentors and role models, as much as aspire to be like them. And, he gripped his fists and looked back, green meeting green. Todoroki is not you. You're not him. Endeavor stared back with wide eyes as the two stood in the hallway. Izuku stood his ground, even as the shock passed, and the temperature ramped up as he saw Endeavor glaring at him hard before huffing, marching down and away. Izuku turned back, looking at the hallway that lead to the tunnel. Todoroki, he's trapped on that path because of Endeavor, because of everything in his life, forcing him to deny his full potential out of spite for that man, to never become the best hero that he can be, to get a possible internship with the number two hero though if he fought well. No, he's not going to fight Todoroki harder just for that. The successor to the symbol of peace strode on, no longer aiming to just say I am here. Izuku has something else to do. His left side itched. It was a problem that started when Shoto made his commitment to using his right side. All that ice, freezing his left side to the point it burned and only using the minuscule sparks from his left side to thaw himself out only made the feeling even worse. And when he let out the heat, when he tapped into that power, the feeling left with it. You disgrace me, Shoto. Those words made the dual-haired boy grit his teeth. What right did he have to say that to him? He'd gotten this far, made it the Elite Eight, allowed his team to dominate the War of the Flags for as long as they did, all without using the old man's quirk. He was dominant, with only two exceptions. Knowing that man, he was probably getting back to his spot at the top, readying himself to watch Shoto fight one of those exceptions. His mother's quirk would be enough though. Even with Midoriya's power, Shoto only needed to tire him out and then freeze over him as he did Takage. Midoriya broke the ice with Sato's help. On his own, he doubts it. The only surefire way Midoriya can shatter his ice is to unleash the kind of raw strength that broke his body during the entrance exam. Battle trial and during the USJ incident. But in doing so, it would be like facing down one of All Might's punches. Even the gale force winds that come from Midoriya's all-or-nothing strikes can shatter stone like wet paper. Remember, your duty is to surpass All Might. Still with one punch, no matter how big, his glacier would shatter like glass. But he has two shots. After that, he's dead in the water. One quick freeze up and it's victory. No matter the speed of his mother's quirk, there was the chance that Midoriya could go faster. And if that happens, you'll reach your limit soon enough. You did so twice after all. You're falling into a pattern. You need me. You need my gift. Because you are just like me in the fact that you despise losing. Maybe even more than you hate me. Shoto bit his lip till he tasted copper, seething at the memory of the old man talking to him before he came out to the arena. That man was wrong. Number two hero or not, he was nothing more than an overgrown child who couldn't make it to number one on his own. He would sit there in the stands, he would fume with those flames of his, and he would watch one of the exceptions get swept aside by a quirk that wasn't his. The quirk that belonged to a family he took advantage of and made their daughter their sacrificial lamb to cover for their mistakes. Hero, endeavor is anything but. Footsteps echoed through the hallway but they were drowned out as the alarm blared. Surprisingly, Midoriya was quiet as the two met the crowd, marching forward with his face set in stone. Shoto ignored them all, finding that man sitting exactly where he thought he would be. Shoto glared, even if he wasn't able to see it. And heading right into the second match of the second round, we're bringing you one base blasting power show. Cause in the red corner, he's got two colors, he's got the family, it's the powerhouse among powerhouses, Todoroki Shoto from Class 1A. Another roar, these people never stopped screaming about useless things. And in the blue corner, also from Class 1A, while super plain with a mop of green hair, he's been a blast of lightning. Will he keep this streak up in his first true fight in this tournament? Give it up for Midoriya Izuku. Midoriya swallowed the praise but recouped, focusing on him as his green eyes were hard. They were like before in the war. Determined. Good, he won't hold back. Next to them, Midnight didn't bother with the introduction. The second she raised her bullwhip, the crowd went quiet and Shoto took a deep breath. He took on last glance at the old man. You better watch old man. Midnight glanced at him, Shoto nodded, and reached for the cold of his right side, visible warm air exiting from his nostrils. Because you should know after this. She looked to Midoriya, and he nodded, and Shoto could already see the small sparks of lightning that was about to arc across his skin. They shuffled their feet, eyes focused on each other. I'm not your tool, and I never will be. Begin. The bell sounded, the crowd roared, and Izuku charged, lightning crackling around him as he zeroed in on his opponent. Todoroki unleashed a surge of ice. Izuku leapt to the right and charged once again upon landing. Todoroki snarled and launched another surge at him. Izuku leapt over him, his whole body glowing green. A pillar of ice erupted from the ground. Izuku grit his teeth and dodged to the side, avoiding the pillar. 
He landed amid the storm and saw Todoroki standing there, not ten yards away. He broke into a run, but Todoroki was already moving, sliding easily away on a glittering wave of frost. Todoroki turned to face him and thrust out his hand. The ice erupted, forcing Izuku to dodge. He landed in a kneeling pose and looked for his opponent. The green-haired boy kept the attack, charging at Todoroki as he sidestepped another surge of ice spikes. The true successor to the symbol of peace leapt, roaring as he did a spinning kick. He caught nothing but shattered ice as the dual-haired boy slid away once more. There was Todoroki his breath coming out in puffs of white steam as he stood some twenty yards away. He's getting slower, Izuku thought. The ice is slowing him down, slowly but surely, like before during the war. I have to keep the pressure on. He broke into a run, his fist crackling with light green lightning. Todoroki's whole body was steaming, trying to thaw the ice. His lip curled, and he thrust out his left hand. Izuku sidestepped the surge, only to see another come his way. He grunted, jumping high once more, feeling the cold in his feet as the ice flashed past. Izuku landed, and only then noticed that there were two walls of ice, one on each side of his body. His heart clenched as he realized his predicament and saw Todoroki on his knees, teeth bared in a snarl of fury. Another storm of ice roared towards him, and Izuku knew that he was trapped. The walls were too high for him to jump, so he began jumping up the walls, going from wall to wall as he used one for all to enhance his fingertips and his feet to dig into the ice, avoiding it. He then pulled upwards, avoiding the ice spikes as he leapt over the frost hallway. He looked around, and saw Todoroki backing away, his body wreathed in clouds of steam. He charged once more. The crowd roared at the display. What an opening. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A-S got Todoroki on the back foot. Todoroki took a deep breath and Izuku charged once more. He thrust out his hand, the air in front of him turning to ice in an instant. A great wall of ice erupted out in front of him, spikes and jagged edges slashing out as it barreled forward. The green-haired boy glanced around, trying to think. To his left was the arena's edge, to his right the ice wall he just escaped from. The wall was too big to punch through, unless he wanted to shatter his arm. Izuku jumped to the left, landing just inches from the edge. He looked up, and saw an opening, a path to Todoroki as the dual-haired boy was thawing. And then Todoroki aimed his hand again, but no ice spikes came surging out. Instead a flash freeze of frost came out, going faster and covering the ground as if it turned into an ice rink. He saw the ice forming around his boots. His blood ran cold. If he jumped onto the ice wall to his right, Todoroki would trap him for sure. If he goes to the left, he will be out of bounds. Todoroki is firing his salvo. With nowhere to run, is this the end of the road for Midoriya? Todoroki glared at him and released one last surge. Izuku clenched his teeth as the ice came towards him and readied himself to take it straight on. Though ahead Midoriya, Shoto thought darkly, will you lose here gracefully or will you sacrifice your arm? He thought back to the entrance exam, and at the USJ, when Midoriya had smashed Shigaraki's face in. That Shigaraki was not a puddle of gore proved that Midoriya had some restraint, as did his progress in getting his power under control. But with this much ice surging his way, he would have no choice. Midoriya had two shots. Shoto had plenty, so long as he could thaw himself. End of the line, Midoriya. The surge was upon him. Shoto saw him raise his hands. S-M-A-A-S-H. The ice was destroyed, wind whipping round Izuku's hand as the wall was blasted into splinters. Shoto grunted as the blast hit him, throwing him backwards into one of his previous ice walls. He closed his eyes against the wind, forcing his mind to focus. He opened his eyes and gasped. Midoriya was standing there, unhurt. His striking arm should have been swollen, misshapen, its skin an ugly red. Instead it was as strong and healthy as a moment ago. Except for the middle finger, the ball throw, Shoto gritted his teeth as he remembered. Midoriya had passed that silly test by focusing his power into one finger. It had been so long ago that he had forgotten. Calm down. He only has nine more fingers. The look on Midoriya's face told the whole story. He was fighting back tears, biting back the agony that was surely tormenting him. If he's in a corner, he'll destroy himself to get out. I need only to keep attacking, and I'll win. A simple enough strategy, but sometimes simple was best. Ignoring the pain in his left side, Shoto aimed his hand, just as Midoriya charged again. Too slow, Shoto barked, swinging underhand as icicles erupted from the ground. Midoriya leapt to dodge them. He didn't hear the gasp of the audience as he looked up, right into the sun. Shoto closed his eyes, blinded by the glare. Midoriya's foot caught him in the face, sending him flying across the arena. His body skipped like a stone on a pond, frost cracking at his skin with every impact, making him yell with pain. He managed to stop and rolled onto his feet. He rose, eyes wide with anger as Midoriya charged again, 
teeth bared, Shoto conjured ice beneath his feet, the wave carrying him away and around the unfrozen part of the arena in a semicircle. He landed, and with a snarl of rage slammed his fist into the arena floor. Splinters of ice the size of houses erupted from the ground, surrounding him. Shoto shivered. The last time he's had this much trouble was back during the battle trial. He gritted his teeth, the fire within him burning hot, thawing his cold body. It felt good, for all that he hated that power. Just a few more seconds. He sensed a shadow over him, and Shoto rolled out of the way, barely avoiding a diving strike from Midoriya who came down, arms outstretched and coming down on one leg. The boy leapt to his feet, his green eyes meeting Shoto's own. He raised his right hand, index finger curled to flick, glowing white hot. Shoto conjured ice behind him, only to see Midoriya charge at him, rearing back with his left. A feint, Shoto roared, conjuring an ice pillar and slamming it into Midoriya, right when his fist caught his jaw. Both boys flew backward from the cross counter, Shoto staggering a bit while Midoriya landed hard as he rolled across the arena floor. Shoto ran at him, his body steaming as the frost melted. Time to finish this, wind slammed into him, sending him flying. Instinct conjured ice walls behind him, his back slamming into and through them, one after another. Finally he stopped, slumping to the ground, and looking up at his foe. Midoriya was standing there, shaking, his right index finger broken. You're insane, you know that. Shoto hissed. Midoriya's eyes flickered in surprise and anger. You're one to talk. He barked back, baring his teeth. Shoto cocked an eyebrow. Really now? You're the one who's destroying his own body. He barked, slamming his right foot down and sending an ice surge his opponent's way. Midoriya dodged, and then charged at him, green lighting arcing around him. Shoto charged in turn, ducking and sliding to avoid a left-handed lariat. He turned mid-slide, raising his right arm. But Midoriya kicked at him like a horse, his left foot catching Shoto's arm, making him yelp in pain. Midoriya pivoted on the spot, lightning flashing around him as he kicked out again. The kick caught Shoto in his gut hurling him up into the air. Midoriya lashed out as he rose, cracking Shoto on the jaw with his right fist. Shoto was sent flying, hitting an ice wall and landing in a heap. He pulled himself back up, stars flashing at the corners of his eyes, and had to throw up his arms as Midoriya kicked him again, sending him crashing back through the wall. W-O-O-W. Midoriya has Todoroki in a corner. This fight looked like Todoroki's, but now Midoriya has turned the tables. And with broken fingers too, Shouta narrowed his eyes, focusing on the battle before him. Midoriya had come a long way, no doubt about it. He had expected the fight to be over in the first minute with Todoroki's victory, most likely less. But Midoriya had not only managed to avoid being frozen in place, he had even laid blows on Todoroki himself. Sensei, Shouta looked up, and Midoriya was grinning, even with tears in his eyes. He gripped his hand, the one with the broken index finger. I can still move, so you can, he thought, feeling a touch of pride. Midoriya had started at the bottom of the barrel in terms of students he'd let pass. Yet over the course of this sports festival, he had surprised Shouta again and again. Still, it was disheartening to see Midoriya relapse into destroying his body again. Granted, considering his opponent he might not have had a choice. Although even if Midoriya won this, fighting Bakugo would be too much of a tall order in his condition. Those movements though, particularly that jumping motion whenever he leaps up to do a diving kick. Ah, uh, of course. Parker at the jump test. Picking and choosing aren't you? Smart. Shouta thought to himself, before he narrowed his eyes, a question nagging within him. Why? Why wasn't Midoriya going for the kill? Todoroki was struggling to get to his feet and clearly hurt. We'll need to build up your durability, Shout amused, putting on his teacher's cap. Then again, none of this would be an issue and could have been resolved quickly if you had used your fire. He looked across the stadium, and saw Endeavor standing by himself at the top of one of the stair aisles. His flames were burning bright, yet despite his son's struggling, he was smirking in smug satisfaction. Get up, Izuku yelled, panting hard. His two broken fingers on his right hand seared like hot irons, yet he forced himself to focus on Todoroki as he staggered to his feet. The dual-haired boy coughed before he turned his attention to the green-haired boy, glaring venomously. He had to know. He had to know. What is a hero? Izuku yelled. For a moment, the other boy looked bewildered. The hell are you on about? Todoroki hissed back, anger replacing his confusion. Answer me. Why should I? Todoroki let off another ice surge, but Izuku dodged it easily. Why are you here? At UA Academy, Izuku demanded, charging once again. The glaring dual-haired boy's answer was a slam of his right foot and took off to the side, a small pillar thwarting Izuku's advance as he circled around and raised his hand, only for Izuku to pivot and jump towards him, arms outstretched as he leapt over a wall. 
Parker jumped like that, arms spread wide to give him balance whenever he came down, one leg out, one leg in. You're here to be a hero right? So what's a hero Todoroki? Izuku twirled in midair, striking at the ice wave as the dual-haired boy was sliding on with a spinning left-handed punch. The ice shattered, sending the ice user crashing to the ground. Izuku winced, his hand aching under the strike. Todoroki growled between his teeth, snarling in fury as he rose from the hard concrete of the arena floor, digging into the scratches on his hands as he pushed himself upwards. Are you a hero or a damn preacher? He hissed back. A hero is someone that does everything he can to save people, yelled Izuku, raising his fist towards him, eyes glimmering with tears that didn't seem to be from broken fingers. Everything Todoroki, not just what he thinks is convenient. Go to hell, he roared. Ice surged from his body, forcing Izuku to jump high or be caught. Below him, the ice spread across the arena floor until only a little was left uncovered. He landed amid the broken ice walls, gritting his teeth against the pain in his fingers. If you want to be a hero, you have to give everything to that. Izuku ran at Todoroki again, the lightning from one for all searing the ground around him, drawing back his fist to strike. Todoroki's eyes widened, and Izuku's fist plunged into his gut, hurling him back. But in that instant, Todoroki touched him. Ice surged from him, surrounding and encasing Izuku. Before he knew it, he could not move his right half imprisoned by the ice, frozen to the floor. Todoroki rolled across the floor before hitting an ice wall. He groaned as he pulled himself to his feet, staggering as he stood up. Izuku's eyes were wide with the biting cold submerging his broken right arm and functioning right leg. But he forced himself not to scream. You're shivering. Shoto croaked. Guess your best dot 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 isn't good enough dot 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 to beat me. He glanced to the side, up at where Endeavor stood, high up in the stadium glaring down at him as people began to move away from the simmering titan of a man. Still dot 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 with this I can give it to the old man. I'm grateful dot 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 for your effort. But now, he focused on Izuku. The air itself felt as cold as winter. Izuku glared hard and focused his quirk into his right ring and pinky fingers. Wrong. The ice exploded, sending a gust of wind at Todoroki. Izuku stumbled forward, free from the ice prison as he bit his lip, muffling a scream. All of his fingers save for his thumb were busted now. Four shots left. You're the one who's shivering. Todoroki. Izuku growled. Quirks like ours have limits. You've been using your left side to thaw yourself out, but it's been getting slower and slower the more you use your ice. I can see it now. Todoroki's eyes widened, clearly surprised. Everyone's been giving it their all dot 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 but you're not. Izuku went on as he panted. You're holding back. Tears of pain and frustration welled in his eyes. Your quirk is half hot half cold right? Well, you're half assing it right now. Todoroki's eyes widened, and for a moment, Izuku saw nothing but blind irrational fury. Fuck you. Todoroki's eyes burned with rage. He fired more ice, but Izuku sidestepped it easily. There was no force in it, no speed, not like before. Do you think you can half-ass being a hero? He yelled, the adrenaline doing its job in blocking out the pain from his broken fingers. I will be the greatest hero in the world, I told you that. Todoroki snapped back, finally pulling himself to his feet. Now shut the he. His voice was cut off as Izuku reached him, grabbing him by the scruff of his UA. Uniform before twisting and slamming the surprised ice user against the concrete. The air rushed out of the ice user's lungs, his opponent leaning over him. Izuku was breathing hard, as was the boy with the heterochromatic eyes staring up at him. If you don't give it your all Todoroki, Izuku panted. Then bad things happen. People get hurt. Like at USJ. Even when everyone was in danger and even when Parker could have died you never once thought to use it. Even when it could have helped. He grit his teeth, eyes moist. That's why. That's why you have to give it your all, every time. Because people need heroes to do that when they're in trouble. If we can't do that, then we don't deserve to be heroes. Shoto froze. Around him, he did not hear the ambience of the stadium, too engrossed in the fight. The words echoed inside him as his eyes widened. He felt as if water from the Arctic washed over him, striking him to the core. The words made the memories return. And he did, indeed remember. He remembered helping Kirishima and Yayorazu to carry Parker's stretcher. He remembered the glazed eyes, bruised flesh, broken bones, and the blood. He remembered the looks in their eyes, their despair and fear. He remembered how they had spoken to Parker to keep him from closing his eyes, lest he never open them again. But he couldn't remember ever considering using his fire. Not once, not even after when he wondered what he could have done differently. Midoriya was right. The green-haired boy had stepped away from him, allowing him time and space to get up. He heard present Mike shout something, but he couldn't tell what. He moved to get to his feet, noting his hands as he moved. 
They were shaking. They never shook normally, not from the cold of his quirk. Do you want to be a hero or not? Todoroki, Midoriya wiped at his eyes. Ironic considering he was staring with a steel gaze, one wouldn't think he had given his tears. Midoriya stepped forward. Shoto felt his heart sink, a terrible, sick coldness wrapping around it as he stepped back. But, I told you. He yelled back, his cry almost a wail of despair. He trembled as he said it, voice choking up with emotion. Midoriya, he was right but, but, I can't. I can't give him that. Not after what he did. He couldn't. He just couldn't. For all those years he had been condemned to be that man's son. To live under his roof, to eat his food, to carry his name, to be beholden to his generosity. This was his only revenge, the only way he could strike back. This was all he had. And yet dot 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 his revenge had nearly killed Parker. So what? Midoriya yelled back. He's not here. And he wasn't there Todoroki. You are. Midoriya seems to be talking to Todoroki. Bellowed present Mike. We can't hear a thing, but it looks like he's seen a ghost. Midoriya was moving. In the blink of an eye he was there, right in front of him. Get away from me. Shoto tried to conjure his eyes, but it wouldn't come, not in time. Midoriya's fist hit him in the shoulder, sending him sprawling to the floor. He gasped and grunted, trying to force himself up. Damn it. No. He can't lose. Not here. How can you be a hero if you don't do your best? Ranted Midoriya, eyes pleading. What if he had died because of your grudge? Please Todoroki, go all out. All those times he has lost ever since coming here. Deep inside Shoto, something snapped. You're wrong. He shrieked, his eyes bulging with despair and anger. He didn't die. I'll do it all without that monster's fire. And that includes, defeating you. Icicles erupted from the ground around him. But they were too slow. Midoriya leapt past and landed in front of him, striking him on the chin once again with a kick. And Todoroki crashed through an ice wall and rolled across the ground. Everything hurt, ached so much. His vision was getting blurry. Are you just going to get through your life holding back, Todoroki? Midoriya yelled. Look at you. You're ready to fall over, and I can do this all day. He held out his broken hand and bared his teeth, challenging. So come at me with everything you got. And clenched said hand into a solid fist. I've had it with Yaowu. Shoto let out a roar and thrust out his hand. But it was numb, unfeeling. Og, he tried to conjure more ice, but his quirk would not obey him. He coughed and fell to the floor. T-O-D-O-R-O-K-I is down. Is this the end of the line for the son of the number two hero? Is this our first major upset of this tournament? He had to thaw. He needed to thaw. His body had gotten too cold. Already he could feel the pain of frostburn, his fingers and hands going numb, the cold spreading up his arms. If this went on, he'll start suffering from frostbite. No dot 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 not like this. He fought back the tears, the pain. I have to win. I have to beat him. I have to. I need to. He wailed. Todoroki. Midoriya yelled as Shoto felt feeling return to his arm, even with the tips of his fingers feeling numb as he did his utmost to combat the frostbite. He rose his head, seeing Midoriya standing there. For a moment, he felt strangely dot 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 soft. Those eyes, that look on his face. Why did he look so dot 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 sad? Shoto raged. It erupted within him like a volcano. How dare he pity him? How dare he look upon him with sorrow? After everything he said, he remembered. I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be someone who scares mommy. It's all right, Shoto. You want to be a hero, right? Ignore your siblings. They are irrelevant and beneath you, Shoto. A hiss, a hiss of steam. I can't stand it, mother. His left side. It's hideous. He is looking more and more like him by the day. Mommy. The hiss shrieked and Shoto burned. Is your dad in your pocket? Is he in your head? Midoriya declared as he panted, wincing as he gripped his right wrist. Stop asking these fucking stupid questions. Shoto roared at the top of his lungs, getting to his feet, feeling the fire boil within him. Midoriya looked on the verge of tears. Stop giving me pity you son of. Then it's your power. Midoriya wailed, almost as if he was begging. Not his, it's yours. Shoto paused, the words ringing inside his head. Words, mere words. Words of a kind he had not heard in many years, not since that day. Mere words, that should have had no power over him. And yet, well Shoto, you don't have to be like your father. Shoto opened his mouth, and he felt his eyes brim with tears. He remembered. All of it. Parker in the stretcher. The looks on his classmates after the USJ. Midoriya standing before him. Mon embracing him that day when they watched All Might's interview. The pain of the ice and frostbite around him faded, and he remembered her words. He felt warmth. Promise me, that you'll be the hero, that you want to be. Shoto roared at the top of his lungs, and the center of the arena became an inferno. W-H-O-A-A-A. What's T-H-I-I-I-S? The ice melted, and his body never felt so relieved. You're insane, Midoriya, said Shoto in a wry tone, as the flames danced around him. 
You could have crushed me. You could have won this easily. But you couldn't keep your mouth shut, could you? Fine then. Then I won't stop. He would never make sense of this. He would never understand him. Midoriya Izuku, the bright-eyed mumbling fool with a head full of heroic dreams, and a quirk he could barely control. Midoriya Izuku, who could have finished him with a single blow, but instead talked himself out of the victory he deserved. But amid those dancing flames, amid the glorious inferno of his rebirth, he saw Midoriya standing there, unfazed by the deadly heat. He was smiling, no, grinning. It was that big, stupid, toothy grin, the one on his mask, the one that reminded him of. He was not what he was. The old Todoroki Shoto was dead, consumed in the Empyrean fire that his pain and hate had imprisoned for so long. His flame was free, and it was his. His flame. His fire. Because I. I wanna be a hero too. W-H-O-A-A-A. What's T-H-I-I-I-S? The whole stadium stared as the arena erupted in a firestorm. Even the robots trying to repair the mics retreated from the steam and the heat. From his vantage point far up in the stadium, Tashinori watched in wonderment. He had felt such pride in young Midoriya, actually gaining the upper hand against someone like Todoroki. And he had been confused, bewildered, when instead of going in for the proverbial kill, Midoriya had started ranting and raving, cursing his opponent. Todoroki had vowed never to use his fire. Endeavor had said it was just a phase, just teenage rebellion. So then why was Midoriya doing this? No way. Tashinori put it together in his head. You made him use his left side. Midoriya, are you saving young Todoroki? From himself, he could see the grin on young Midoriya's face and felt a twinge of mingled pride and embarrassment. Still so utterly obvious. But even more wondrous was the look on young Todoroki's face. That beatific, almost serene smile, as if he had looked upon the face of God, tears rolling down his face, as if he hadn't smiled in years. S-H-O-O-T-O-O-L. It was Endeavor, marching down the steps, eyes bright with joy and pride as flames danced around him. The cameras had mics trained on him. That's my boy. It took you long enough, but better late than never. Endeavor ranted, his face split in a devilish grin. This is your starting line, your beginning. Now with my power in your hands, you will succeed where I failed and reach the pinnacle. He got to the bottom of the staircase, eyes burning with obsession. And you will make my dream come true. He finished, reaching the bottom of the stairs. Toshinori stared down at him. Endeavor, all that dot 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 for this. Endeavor is cheering for his son. Present Mike spoke in a plain tone. What a loving father. Shoto stood by, still wreathed in fire, as Midoriya managed to stand up. You could have finished me, Midoriya. He called out, triumph raising his voice. I'll make you regret it. Never. Midoriya called back, eyes bright with wonder, still wet with joyous tears. I'll never regret this, no matter what. No, there were no words. Except maybe one. Midoriya. You'll be a hero. He called out, readying the power erupting from within him. From his right, ice spikes surged behind him. From his leg, fire blazed out like an afterburner. But not before I beat you. Fine. Midoriya bent down, rearing his left arm back as green lightning surged out and cracked the ground as if he was a Tesla coil. Bring it on. No holding back. Around him, the ice evaporated into superheated steam. He heard Cementos and Midnight yell out, but he didn't care. He owed it to his classmate. No holding back. The flames vanished, and Shoto unleashed a wall of ice at Midoriya. It erupted across the arena like a thunderbolt, growing like a glacier, spikes erupting from all sides. The ice slammed into giant cement walls, crushing them as they speared past. And the fire speared through, melting the cement into molten slag. Shoto let out a breath, his arms falling down. He saw the smoke and debris shift by his side. And there was Midoriya on the ground, maybe ten meters away, covered in bruises, his right leg mangled and distorted. Yet his left arm was raised and glowing. Ah, so he didn't meet it head on. He had dodged it, and rolled across the ground, to be beside him. He would have lifted his arms, but his strength was gone. He saw Midoriya lift his left arm, one finger still glowing. He got him, but still, Midoriya, thank you. He barely felt the blow, or the impact as he crashed through the ice wall behind him, his last ice wall. Nor did he feel the grass as he landed outside the ring. He sighed in exhaustion as the world seemed to whisper away like ash on the wind. He was so very tired. Fayumi always did a great job making his futon back home. He should thank her more often for that. He couldn't wait to get back into it as he closed his eyes. Ack, wait, he's in bounds. Midnight spoke, flustered. Okay, Todoroki is out of bounds. The winner by ring out is Midoriya. Bless peace. Then silence. Holy shit. There were a hundred things that Shouta wanted to do right now. First and foremost, he would beat the ever-loving tar out of his two stupidest students for ignoring the fact that the refs were two seconds from calling the match, 
and they blasted through anyway. Not even Cementos walls could withstand Todoroki's salvo. Going full force, clashing against a villain was a surefire way to get yourself killed or have the area get blown apart, or both if the world wanted to be particularly vindictive at that moment. Second, he would tell them right then and there that a fight against classmates was not the place to throw around the full power of their quirks. Midoriya for all the progress that he'd made no doubt was only scratching the surface of his abilities despite relapsing every now and then, and Todoroki had a literal legacy hero to show how powerful his flames could get. Combined with his ice abilities made for an effective combination. Left unused they might have been. The potential for clashing super moves might not have ended as well as it did. One misstep. And that force could have fried Midoriya like a chicken or if Todoroki hadn't braced himself. He could have become the first person on planet Earth to know how it feels to have their heads smashed through fully formed ice and concrete in the same instant. Shouta silently cursed his eyes. Fat lot of good his promises as a teacher were. He had been ready to stop a fight before. Now the worst was this close to coming true right in front of him and he couldn't even find it in himself to look. He needed to see Recovery Girl as soon as possible, if only to make sure that this kind of battle didn't happen with the students during training, or God forbid against a villain. Although with the two students being carted away on stretchers, the cheers of the audience and the blur of social media indicated how much they had loved this spectacle. All Midoriya and Todoroki needed was polishing refinement, knowing when to hold back and when not to. And those two could easily become the greatest heroes of this generation, perhaps greater than the previous one. Of course, the potential of two students being permanently crippled didn't stop a certain someone. It was big, ladies and gentlemen. I can't stress this enough dear listeners. We just saw heroic history, the big blast, the true clash, the, they get it, Shouta grumbled, big boom, had to see it. Oh, don't be like that, Mike said, posing for a camera that only he could see, that will give us footage for a thousand highlight reels. Fantastic, Shouta said, rolling his eyes. Mike proceeded to wax lyrical about how this year had the biggest group of prodigies or guaranteed pro heroes, his own subtle push to help the students get some internship invitations in their inbox. Ignoring it, Shouta Aizawa focused on two figures. The first was Midoriya, the winner of the match. What on earth was he thinking, letting Todoroki unleash his fire like that? Considering the strategy that the boy had been employing, Midoriya would have ended up with the win due to Todoroki's stubborn insistence on using only half of his quirk. Except, it wasn't an insistence anymore, he had used it. Microphones weren't allowed on the field. Plenty of phrases would get through the sensors if that was allowed, so Shouta could only guess at what the two of them were talking about. Whatever it was, it was enough to get Todoroki to do what Shouta was hoping that he would do since he started attending UA. Accomplishment or not, it was akin to telling your opponent that they had a gun at their belt that they hadn't used yet. A psychological attack at best and the single stupidest thing you could do in the middle of a fight 99% of the time. Midoriya was smart enough to know that getting Todoroki to use his fire would do nothing but put him at a disadvantage. So why? The second was the number two hero. Endeavor was at the edge of the arena, his massive frame towering over the guardrail to the point that it looked like he was going to crush it with a single twitch. From up here, the flame hero looked conflicted, halfway between pride and sullen understanding with a twinge of acceptance in it. A rare look on most people, incredible to see on Endeavor's features. He watched as the medical robots wheeled Todoroki away on a stretcher. Despite putting up a good effort at the end of his fight, he was out like a light, and Endeavor moved after him, jumping down to follow his son. The more serious injuries were still on Midoriya, whose medical team was helping him off the mat and leading him towards a no-doubt livid recovery girl. Curious, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Estranged as he might be, a father still deserved to talk to his son. Wow, like holy shit quirks were strong. Peter slumped against the wall. He'd spent the last match all but transfixed on the match on the monitor in front of him. It was like watching those old videos of Thor and the Hulk with Ned. The old Norse god bringing down enough power to shatter the campus of a college with a single swing. The green rage monster punching an alien space whale and stopping it in its tracks. Smashing. Whatever physics allows Midori to summon hurricane winds from his finger against Todoroki's fire must have at least caused him to flinch. Though, from what Ned figured, it probably would have only made him blink. Still, that was awesome. Not the craziest thing that the young boy from Queens had seen in his tenure as Spider-Man. But then again, not much could top what he had gone through. After you become the stabilizers to a falling jet, things start appearing a little less crazy. Peter grimaced, knock on wood and all that, because the last time he thought something like that, a space donut came out of nowhere and then. He shook his head, he needed to be anywhere but here. Now, which way was it back to the stands again? 
He followed the signs till a tingle went down his spine. Peter froze at the corner of the hallway, right before the flame hero himself walked through, not noticing the American. And if Peter could say it, what the heck did the number two hero eat because he was almost as tall as All Might? Did powerful quirks just make you taller or something? Cause the height to power correlations around here frankly made no sense. Still, what was he doing here? Peter nearly smacked himself in the head. Right, Todoroki was his son. Or weren't they both Todoroki because that was their family name? Was it Enji and Shoto right? Stupid questions for later. Peter glanced down the hallway, watching as Endeavor took a spot next to the open entrance. A second later, he could hear the medical bots wheeling in Shoto which was definitely Peter's cue to leave. This was probably one of those deep and meaningful conversations that comic books discussed. One would be remembered for years or something. Maybe. He can stay for a minute. You shouldn't unleash so much power at once, Endeavor said calmly. Your control over the flame is still too dangerous for you to use it all instantaneously. Much like using too much of your ice can give you frostbite and slow you down. Using too much of your fire can leave you both dehydrated and give you burns. There was a beat of silence, and Peter heard the older hero chuckle a little bit. What? You're not going to ask why are you so happy? I lost didn't I were you? Endeavor guessed coyly, well, that might be true. But you showed the world what your fire combined with your ice is capable of. A good first step, and it'll be the last time that you'll ever lose. You may have lost this battle, but you will win the war in the end. In time, I'll show you exactly how to walk a conqueror's path. Peter heard a tired Todoroki sigh. Honestly, even if I did win, I don't think it would have mattered. I could have won. But there's no way that things could flip around so easily, Todoroki said cryptically. Even so, you accepted my gifts. I am grateful that you came around to see reason. Endeavor smirked, given his tone. Accept his gifts. What was Todoroki and Gion about? Your gifts? Shoto asked. No, it's my power alone. And it is a great and terrible one. I realize that now, and with it, Peter craned his head out, peeking lightly as he saw Shoto on the stretcher looking up at a hand, the back of Endeavor before him, is a great and terrible responsibility. Peter felt his heart skip several beats, the tone of his voice, his expression. It was, in a way, looking into a foggy-looking mirror, but I will perfect it. After all, I wanna be a hero too. Not the one you want me to be, but the one I wanna be. Todoroki finished, bringing his hand down upon his chest. The massive flaming hulk of a hero shrugged. Hmm, of course, whatever you say. Now, get patched up and go parking lot B. Sasaki will drive you home and you can recover there. No thanks, I'll stay here, Shoto said softly, with my classmates. During the fight, in that moment, when Midoriya was rushing forward, I forgot about you. H&M, Endeavor huffed lightly, forgot about him. What the heck happened between those two? Peter's mind ran wild with stupid ideas, all of them coming back to a different Star Wars reference. The American just started walking. He glanced back just in time to see the medical bots bring Shoto around the corner. The dual-haired student met his gaze and for the first time since the two met, there was nothing but calm. No rage, no fire, no sheer icy coldness, just Todoroki looking at Peter like he was just another guy on the street. Though, he did look confused after a second, maybe wondering why Peter was here. Peter puckered his lips, feeling awkward at not walking away. Even though listening in on this was intriguing, he felt a bit dirty about it. Although Todoroki didn't seem all that offended, just staring at Peter blankly. Say something man, you're creeping me out. Gotta break the ice then. The American chuckled, pointing up at the monitor at the edge of the hallway. Caught your match man, pretty sweet stuff. Todoroki blinked once, nodding his head, thanks. Uh, sorry you lost. Peter spoke in a sympathetic yet awkward tone. The boy shrugged, complete indifference overtaking him. Peter fidgeted. I'm aw, sure you tried your best. With your dad cheering you on. Todoroki looked down, flexing his left hand before his eyes turned towards Peter. How much did you hear? Ack, no helping about it now. Peter flinched, blushing as Todoroki blinked. Um, um enough. Sorry for eavesdropping like that. I didn't want to like, get in the way of your dad and stuff. He's like that. Todoroki mused with a shrug, looking down as he yawned. Guess he didn't seem to mind. So, you not heading home. Gonna watch the rest of the matches. Yes, I am. Todoroki replied, the boy now looking up at Peter as his eyes softened, almost as if he was ashamed. If I am keeping you from the doctors don't let me hold you. Peter raised his hands, stepping back. Just get yourself patched up and join the class. Maybe get yourself some ice cream or something when you're healed. He smiled warmly. Deputy rep's orders. Peter grinned with a point of his finger. Todoroki blinked before he let out a soft chuckle and a light smile. Whatever you say, deputy representative. With that, the robot somehow sensed the conversation was over and started wheeling him off again. 
Peter watched him go, more confused and curious than anything else. But, he felt happy for him, warm inside at whatever conclusion Todoroki came to when he and Midori talked in the ring. He remembered as he looked down at his hand, at feeling the warm hand on his shoulder, a hand he so wished he could clasp again. Peter doubled back to the stairs, that tingle running through him yet again. He better get ready for his next match, although it probably wasn't going to be right away. Kind of needed an arena for a match. That's right, Todoroki and Midoriya were destroying each other and ruined the arena. All for a sports festival, just like with Bakugo and Pony. He took a deep breath, gritting his teeth as he passed by a TV monitor showing highlights of the fights. Midoriya glowing green with lightning, ready to take on the fiery yet freezing Todoroki. And Bakugo and Pony exchanging staggering explosive strikes and hoof blows. A sports festival. He tightened his fist, focusing in on Bakugo's monitor and the upcoming match of him versus Sato Rikido. He didn't dislike Sato. He seemed like a nice guy but Bakugo was on the other side of the bracket. He goes for those sugar cubes in his belt. He could web them up and end this in seconds. No, this was not just a festival, but an interview. Momo said it best in class a week and a half ago. Sato is his peer, his classmate. Least he can do is offer him a good showing. You know, when I said not to make this a habit, I wasn't expecting you two to treat it like a challenge. Tashinori's shoulders slumped at Recovery Girl's outburst. The shrunken hero and his successor were both trying their best to avoid the nurse's outrage. Standing still wasn't the best idea, but it was the only thing they could do in the small medical room. It was only the four of them there. Young Bakugo had left earlier after the start of the last match to watch Midoriya vs. Todoroki, and young Tsunotori was sound asleep thanks to her quirk. I'm sorry, but it turned out alright, Tashinori tried to play it off while flashing a smile. I mean, he only used five total fingers. And a leg. It didn't work, and Recovery Girl's eye twitched. The fact that his injuries could have been so much worse is not helping. Tashinori paled as the nurse's eyes shifted to a rather large needle on the desk. On the bed, young Midoriya chuckled, awkwardly scratching his cheek. As sorry, Recovery Girl turned around, her anger vanishing instantly at the sight of the teenager, sparing Tashinori from her wrath for the moment. Truly, his successor was closer to being a true hero than he thought. It's nothing you can be blamed for, given who your teacher is, Chio grumbled the last half of the sentence. I'm right here you know, Tashinori said, now feeling slightly miffed. Recovery Girl ignored him, gesturing for Midoriya to lean forward so she could wrap some bandages around his fingers. The boy winced, but didn't move far within Recovery Girl's grip. Tashinori on the other hand, gave the green-haired boy a onsoba. His left leg was fine, as was his arm, but his fingers and right leg left much to be desired before Chio used her quirk. His fingers were being bandaged up, and young Midoriya would be given a cane for the day. After tomorrow, he'd be good as new. Is this really all you can do for him? Toshinori asked. Recovery girl nodded, not looking away from her work. Yes, with this, he'll be healed after a full night's sleep, but he's out of the sports festival now. He is in no shape to fight with no stamina. Midoriya's shoulders slumped. I guess I did bring it on myself but, I couldn't just stand by and let Todoroki anchor himself like that. I, I needed to do something. Chiyo and Tashinori gazed at him before they looked at each other. Honestly, you two are so alike it's frightening. Midoriya laughed lightly, as did the skeletal man. Figured you would want him to stand down if it's that big a deal, Tashinori commented. Which is why I said normally, but I'm getting soft in my old age so I'll do what I can to keep you kids going. Tomorrow you'll be good as new. Midoriya's eyes widened, and he beamed a thankful smile at the nurse. T thank you so much. Recovery girl flashed him a smile. You and the blonde lug back there. I have a name. Might drive me up the wall. Recovery girl screeched, her free hand grabbing hold of the needle. At that moment, the number one hero found himself in front of a foe he could not defeat. The nurse's eyes narrowed behind her visor. She sighed, but even as thick-headed as you are, this festival is one of the few chances you get to show your stuff. I might not like it, but you did your best out there. Hold your head high, young man. Your showings in the race and the war showed your potential as a hero. You'll get internship offers aplenty, I'm sure. She pulls the last bandage tight, letting Midoriya give his hand an experimental squeeze. He barely flinched, a marked improvement from the start. However, recovery girl screeched, wrapping her cane off Midoriya's head. Ouch, he uttered. That doesn't mean I'm letting you go off hurting yourself like you do. If you start flicking those fingers of yours again, they might fracture to the point that you won't be able to move them anymore, no matter what I do. That goes for your arms and legs too by the way. Midoriya paled slightly, looking down at his hand. Tashinori could see a hundred thoughts rush through the young man's mind, and no doubt he would start up another creepy mumble storm if left unchecked. 
The blonde man cleared his throat, cutting Midoriya off before that could start. He offered an assuring smile. I wouldn't worry too much. You've come a long way with one for all already. Just have to get stronger is all. With the internships and my training, you'll do just fine. Midoriya's lips started to quirk up, only to stop as his gaze clouded over. Even so, did I say I am here all might? He asked, and Toshinori offered a face-splitting grin, beating the son of the number two hero, along with your race and war performances. You did splendidly Midoriya and hey, he put his hand on the boy's shoulder and gave him a thumbs up. You didn't make it to the top now, you'll get there someday. The young boy smiled back, nodding. You're right, still, I was looking forward to my next match if I won. With young Bekugo, Toshinori finished. The old hero put a hand to his chin, remembering the blonde's last match. Rather barbaric but when your opponent forced your hand, there wasn't much one could do other than roll with the punches, sometimes literally in his case. Due to the circumstances regarding the previous match, and with reports from the infirmary, stated midnight over the loudspeaker as Cementos finished fixing the arena on the TV screen in the nurse's office. All occupants save for a sleeping pony looked up. Although he won in his match, Midoriya Izuku is unfit to continue due to the severity of his injuries. The bracket showing Midoriya facing against a smirking Bakugo appeared, with the blonde taking up the screen. Bakugo Katsuki will advance to the finals by default. Kakin is in the finals now. Midoriya looked over to the other side of the bracket. Peter Parker was about to face Sato Rikido, and afterwards it would be a Suitsuyu clashing against the sole remaining member of Class 1B, Shizaki Ibarra. Don't worry about that now. Toshinori sat beside the green-haired boy, elbows on his knees. For now, focus on your recovery and join your classmates. I'm sure you'll want to see the rest of the tournament. Though now, all those memories were far away. What mattered now was Midoriya's drive. For all the book smarts hidden away in that head of his, he was as reckless as Toshinori was in his early days. Going above and beyond what was needed, no matter the consequences to himself. A mark of a hero, willing to give everything and more. With that last battle, if push came to shove, Midoriya would hurt himself again, no question about it. Toshinori tried not to sigh, because that was probably his fault. His insistence of using this as his pupil's first big showing had backfired. Not that he wasn't proud, words couldn't describe the growth that Midoriya had shown. But as a teacher, he couldn't bring himself to ignore the possibility that things could progress too far. The memory of Bakugo going above and beyond to achieve victory against Midoriya were all too clear. And if he needed another reminder of what Midoriya might do, he only needed to look at the bandaged fingers and the cane by his bedside and to Tsunotori who slept behind the curtains. Yet, as his mentor, Toshinori couldn't bring himself to stop him from his first big moment. There was no better stage than the sports festival, not with so many heroes watching for the next number one hero. Jesus, if only Nana was here, she'd know what to say. He was sure this was easier when Sora Hiko trained him. But the old hero wasn't here and for now. Midoriya was a good listener and kept his word, outside of that slip-up telling Bakugo about his power. A warning not to go too far should suffice, along with showing his unwavering support to his student when he needed him. Heh, what do you know? I'm starting to get the hang of this teaching thing. Toshinori thought to himself. H hey check it out, the next match is starting, you don't want to miss that. Recovery girl's eyes narrowed to slits, but she glanced back just long enough to notice that Toshinori wasn't just trying to save his own skin. Present Mike was announcing the next match, and from the looks of it, one side was far more focused than the other. And now we have Rikido Sato versus Peter Parker. A class won a slugfist. Parker D.I. didn't have much of a good showing in the last match. Perhaps this is where he begins a slide. Present Mike said aloud. We already had one upset, so anything is possible. Peter stood, hands in his pockets. Across from him, Sato let his fist fly in a practice jab. His breath was racing in his ears and his heart beat like a drum. Guy looked like he was getting ready for a big boxing match, like Mike Tyson bracing himself for the fight of his life. It was a bit too much for a sporting event, wasn't it? Oh, who was he kidding at this point? Peter sighed lightly. Sato actually went as far as to crack his knuckles, shifting his feet like a football player about to take off. You're really into this, aren't you Sato-san? Peter inquired. The big man nodded. Always wanted a crack at you since the quirk assessment tests. All that really showed how far I needed to go with Sugar Rush. He smiled. You're a good dude Parker, but I ain't gonna be holding back. I gotta make my mark too. Peter let out a sigh. Alrighty then, let's do it. Peter glanced over to Midnight, the heroine winking at him but offering no assistance despite his pleading gaze. What was that look for? Are both sides ready? Midnight cued. Yep, Sato said, doing his best impression of a bobblehead. Peter gave a thumbs up. 
then let the match. Midnight raised her whip, begin. Sato's left hand flew to his pouch, going straight for his sugar cubes before plopping them in his mouth. His eyes whited out as he charged, roaring. Peter raised his dukes and saw him throw a barrage of punches, yelling out. Peter blocked and parried each one, and whichever got through his guard, he dodged with his head. He was like a blur, as was the muscular taller boy before him. Look at that. Sato is on the attack, but Parker is defending and dodging by a hair. Sato reared back a big right, and Peter dodged. Geez, I know about sugar highs but you're on cloud nine or something. Is this with just sugar or all sweets? Peter asked. Man he was fast, but Sato drooling. Didn't help in his cool factor. Rawg. Hold still. Sato lashed out with a kick, to which Peter hopped up and over him, avoiding his hands as he yelled. He saw the bulging brute pivot and charge, lashing out with a punch as it crashed into the concrete, wrecking it. Excuse me, my face is up here, Peter blurted out, standing up as he kept on the balls on his feet. His opponent pulled his fist out, shaking out the dust and debris, and ignoring the barizes on his hands. Broa ah. Sato led with a shoulder charge, dust kicking out behind him from the sudden burst of speed, and Peter got low and under him. His hands reached up, grabbing his shirt as he used his force against him and Judo flipped him out. His momentum was carrying him towards the wall, and too fast. I gotcha. The brown-haired boy aimed and fired two web bullets, plucking the tunnel with web as a spider's web formed. And Sato landed in it, wobbling and bouncing like a big bug. The entire arena was flabbergasted. Holy smokes. That was a quick one. Parker wins with a ring out. Oh come on. I didn't even land a hit, Sato yelled, his eyes lucid as he came down from Sugar Rush, struggling in the webbing as Peter walked over, hands once again in his pockets as he removed his web shooters. He went over, tugging and removing the web strands from the wall as he helped the muscular boy down. It'll dissolve in an hour, or just use some heat and it'll melt, Peter assured. Sato was frowning, looking down at the ground as he climbed back to his feet. The crowd roared their approval, and Peter tried throwing out his best smile again, waving to the crowd which only made his nerves worse because they just got louder. They really loved this fighting stuff. Guess this what it was like in Rome then. Still, one more fight down. He looked across the arena back in his suite, seeing a certain blonde sitting with his chin on his closed fist. His brown eyes met his sharp ruby red. One more to go. And you're mine. Peter muttered darkly under his breath, walking back into the tunnel. Hell yeah you see that. That's the future number one, baby. Can you at least pretend that you're on duty right now? Yu winced at the sound of Shinji's voice. Peeking behind her, the wooden hero seemed ready to throttle her with his vines and by the looks of things, Death Arms wanted to help him. A bunch of other civilians were also giving her some looks, and not the kind that she appreciated for business. She laughed it off, waving at the civilians and dropping back in step with her companions on their route. What am I going to do with you? Shinji asked in exasperation. Sorry, you chirped. Shinji gave her a flat look, his eye twitching. Sure you are. You tried not to look too embarrassed but it still showed. Oh, don't be like that, Shinji. No, the wooden hero said, instantly taking the wind out of Yu's sails. You've been stopping at every monitor and Jumbatron to watch Parker and frankly, I don't care anymore. Yu tilted her head as Shinji's shoulders slumped. Even Death Arms gave him a concerned glance. Eventually, the hero known as Kamui Wood straightened up and shook his head. You, I hate to say this, but we're not taking the kid. You felt her eyes bulge out of her head as she rounded on her co-worker. What do you mean? You screamed, he'd be a great fit. He's nice, local, smart, strong. And I have eyes, ears, and a WIFI connection, Shinji said, cutting her off and producing his phone for show. The hero boards have been going crazy over your kid, as well as Endeavor's kid and that Midoriya guy. All three of them have gotten the interest of some in the top ten, the wooden hero explained. If you know what's best for Parker, you'll let him grow under one of them. Not one of us. Trust me, I want him too, but we're better developing someone on the lower end. If you want your ward to be a better hero, the top ten will nurture Parker. You started to say something but Shinji showed her the screen. Every pixel was dedicated to the live feed of discussion between the pros. Several accounts stood out, marked with their large top 10 monikers. I see your point, you said, deflating. Look on the bright side, Death Arms said, at least the top 10 are interested in this year's crop. Indeed we are, you shrieked, nearly jumping out of her skin and into Shinji's arms at the sound. From the stands, several civilians muttered as the ninja hero Edge shot came into view from behind the stands. Shinji gave the elder hero a polite bow and jabbed you with an elbow in an effort to get her to do the same. She pouted for a second before settling on a kind wave and a smile. My apologies for interrupting your conversation, 
The ninja said, I couldn't help but overhear. It's fine, not like we were discussing classified stuff, Death Arms said with a shrug. Though I believe who you're interested in sending internship applications is. Shinji guessed, straightening up again. Edshot chuckled good-naturedly. Hardly. The information will be public as soon as the festival finishes. Though considering the feats of this year's group, I wouldn't put it past a few heroes to have already sent their applications out. Have you? You asked out of reflex. She wilted under her companion's glares but Edshot actually nodded. I've had several sent out so far, Edshot admitted, yourselves. You beamed, we were. Going to wait till the end of the festival, Shinji interrupted. On the clock and all that. Aren't you on the clock too? He asked with crossed arms. A wise choice, but being in the top ten has its privileges, Edshot said. Glancing up, the ninja hero took notice of the Jumbotron. You and the others looked as well, and the finished arena filled the screen. And two young ladies stepped up to the field. The call, recovery girl's quirk was the best quirk ever. At the very least, that was what Pony thought. Her muscles still burned from exhaustion, the burns still stung, and her head felt like a herd of buffalo had trampled over it. But compared to the agony that it had been before she had used her quirk, it felt a lot better. That hadn't meant the woman had let her off the hook though, the aging hero having given her a stern lecture about not pushing herself too far anymore. She was also told on no uncertain terms that she wouldn't be getting out of the cot anytime soon, something that had grated on the Texan's nerves. As much as the humiliation of defeat stung, she didn't want to miss out on Peter's matches, not after he had taken the time to come down here and offer his sympathies for her loss. A luminescent blush spread across the blonde's face at the memory of Peter patting her head, and the warm smile that had seemed to engulf her entire world. She supposed she was fortunate that the experience had left her tongue tied. Otherwise she might have blurted out her feelings for him right then and there. But despite his condolences and her words about how well she had done, she had still lost. Bitterness clung to heart even as she tried to shrug it off. Peter wouldn't have been bitter if he had lost to someone he would laugh it off with a smile and congratulate the victor. He was just that sort of person who could find a chance to be kind even to someone that was considered his opponent. You'll get him next year, okay? We'll both get stronger. Yeah, we will. Together. Those had been the words they had exchanged, and part of Pony hoped that he would recognize the meaning behind her statement dot 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 but she doubted that she had that kind of luck. With a sigh, Pony pressed her head against her pillow as she stared at the monitor screen. A concession to those who had lost, a chance to watch the other matches if they were too injured to carry on. She appreciated the chance to watch Peter, but it wasn't the same as being there in person to cheer him on like he had done for her both times. Ring. Pony pulled her eyes away from the screen to glance towards her cell phone and the caller ID. Mom. Hello. She asked as she answered the call. Sweetie. Came her mother's voice, the warmth and pride evident even over the line. We saw your matches and are so proud of you. I swear your father was shedding a few tears. Yes you were. He was so impressed with your performance. Thank you. She managed to get out even as the tears gathered in the corner of her eyes. The doubts of how well she had done in that last much clung to her thoughts, but dad was a pro. If he was impressed, that meant she had to be doing a good job right. Assuming he wasn't just saying that because she was his little girl. Are you okay, sweetie? That last explosion looked like it hurt. It did, but recovery girl helped a lot. I'm feeling better, Pony said. She hoped that would be enough to ease mom's concerns. She tended to go into extremes when she thought something bad had happened. I'm still bummed that I lost though. I know sweetie, but you should be proud of what you've accomplished in such a short time. You're standing as one of the strongest students in your year right now, and you're only going to get better. Really? She squeaked out. Since when was she considered one of the strongest? You haven't checked out social media yet, have you? Came the amused question. It's been blowing up about you over here. A lot of people are impressed to see an American as one of the top students of UA. The fear that she would be treated differently because of her nationality had always been a fear of Pony. More than one person during the course of her stay in Japan had told her off and stepped on her dream. And on the really bad nights, she had almost believed it. Peter had been the one to convince her that she was still worthy of being a hero and had pushed her to greater heights than she thought possible. To now hear that she was being praised dot 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 it was something she was going to need to see for herself. So dot 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 who is it? I'm sorry. Pony asked, not quite understanding the question. The boy. I. I don't know what you're talking about, came the hurried response even as her cheeks heated up. This dot 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 she knew that her crush on Peter was pretty much an open secret among her classmates. But this really wasn't a conversation she wanted to have with mom. Not without a few days to prep herself at least. Hmm, I don't. She protested. H-M-M-M-M-M-M. The bead of sweat that rolled down her forehead had nothing to do with her exhaustion. 
I mean, maybe there's a boy. Is it Parker? I remember you talking about him all the time while you were getting ready for the entrance exam. And quite a bit after that too. She could almost hear the triumphant smile in her mother's voice, and it took everything she had to not groan. He certainly looks like a nice boy, but your father is going to want to threaten him before you start doing anything sir. It's not like that, she said, lowering her voice a little at the glare recovery girl gave her. In hindsight, she doubted talking on the phone counted as resting, but it wasn't like this was her fault. I, I haven't even told him how I feel yet. Why not? It seemed such a simple question, as though the butterflies and nervousness that racked her like nothing ever had before weren't important, as though all she needed to do was walk up to him and confess her feelings for him. I, I wanted to impress him. He's one of the best students in our year and he's done so much to help me. I, I wanted to show him how good of a hero I was. Sweetie, the compassion in her mother's voice was evident. If he's anything like what I've seen of him so far, you didn't need to do that. And if you did, well then that's a sign you should be looking for someone else. I know dot 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 but after everything that happened I just... The words caught in her throat. They had been in class when Vlad had been called out, and once she had heard what had happened, that Peter had almost been killed. I wanted to do something for him. Dot 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 you've got it bad, sweetie. She really didn't have an answer for that. And not just because she was blushing so much she couldn't answer. Pony, if you really like this boy, tell him how you feel. I know it will be hard. It took your father two years to work up the courage to ask me out, but you'll feel a lot better afterwards. What dot 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 what if he doesn't say yes? It will be awkward. And you'll be sad, came the answer without hesitation or embarrassment. But I don't think he's the type to end a friendship because of something like that. Your father had to ask me out twice before I said yes. But whatever happens, it's not the end of the world. So stay strong and tell that boy how you feel about him. Okay, the blonde Texan said as she wiped away the tears. Just make sure you think things through, as much as I want grandchildren I. Mom, right out of the gate, Peter let his hands fly, streams of webbing soaring over the arena at Shizaki and her weird vine hair. The fights she'd had with Momo and Asui were fresh in his mind. Weird, confusing, and a living contradiction to every law about mass out there. But, like all really cool superpowers, you probably still needed to see in order to use them. So Peter went straight for the eyes, and Shizaki's vines promptly erected a wall between her and the webs, lashing out like snakes to protect her face. Splotches of webbing connected the vines, but that did nothing as the entire conglomerate rushed towards the American. More vines surging out behind the white tangled mess. He leaped into the air, flipping to the side and letting the great green arm miss his head by mere inches just so both wrists could continue their assault on her eyesight. Another vine swatted his projectiles out of the sky and joined its brothers in the assault, Shizaki standing still and clasping her hands together in apparent prayer. Peter dropped low the second his hands hit the pavement. That tingly feeling screamed, and he twisted like a breakdancer. Vines struck from the sides and above, but Peter let his body move, sliding to the side under one strike before leaping over another, all the while throwing in shots of webbing whenever he saw an opening, which was getting him nowhere fast. It was like every piece of her hair was a different, self-controlled entity. The kind of mental gymnastics to move all of them at once must be insane. Peter's eyes widened just in time for him to feel the need to flip back. A line of vines sprouted from the concrete like an angry hand, which only made the feeling all the more intense as more kept coming from the ground, rupturing concrete all the while. His feet and hands left the tremors moments before they struck, cracking the ground around him. With a great push off the ground, Peter slung a line of webbing attached to a large chunk of stone broken off by the vines. Turning as much as physics would allow, the baseball-sized chunk flew at his opponent. Shizaki's eyes retained their calm temperance as a dozen vines sprouted up to defend her. Peter avoided the vine onslaught, sliding away far enough before instinctually stopping himself. Not two inches away was the arena's boundary line. One vine took the chance to strike like a cobra. Peter grabbed hold of it and pulled with all his might. It quickly snapped, nearly sending him over the edge from the recoil. Riding himself, Peter watched as the concrete started cracking around him. Good news, the vines weren't indestructible, so that was a bonus. Bad news, he kinda needed the ground to walk on if he didn't want to get tangled and Shizaki was still as adamant at turtling in her corner. His options were running out by the second, he needed a plan before. Tingle, he ducked, avoiding a vine that would have cracked him upside the head hard enough to make him see stars. Instinct alone stopped him from getting grabbed by others, his body launching off his outstretched hand and quickly skidding to a stop, right in time to see vines curling and reeling back across the arena. 
A flurry of chunks of concrete were thrown by the vines. Peter ducked, twirling and twisting in a way that reminded him of that dude in the Matrix. Basketball-sized chunks rained down on him, and he ran for all he was worth. Jumping over vines, avoiding debris bullets as he jumped and twisted, he fired web shots that only met her wall of vines. Shizaki's green hair was sinking into the arena and spreading like a massive weed and his world spun when one found its mark on his chest, one the size of a car and as thick as a couch. His chest burned as every bit of air was forced from his lungs. By some miracle, he hit a brazier instead of being knocked out of bounds, but the impact still snapped his head back. Peter's chest burned, and his head rang as he fell to the floor, barely recognizing the pain of his knees hitting the concrete. That tingling sensation was roaring right now, and he was running out of options. Shoto tried not to frown upon once again feeling the brace around his back. His injuries had been treated by Recovery Girl, but the nurse insisted that extra precautions were necessary given the extent that the combatants were willing to go in their matches. He didn't blame her, his own match did nothing to dissuade the notion in the slightest. Still, Shoto found himself coming out of the hallway to the section designated to his class holding back a grimace. No one turned to look at him as he approached, so absorbed in the match in front of them. Parker was dancing in between the tide of vines that the class 1B student was throwing at him. One vine came very close, and he heard Kirishima and Yeyarazu breathe sighs of relief when he managed to stay out of harm's way. Stepping up to the front row, he saw that the first seat next to Yeyarazu was open. He cleared his throat, is this seat taken? Yeyarazu flinched, not expecting his voice, but graced him with that professional smile that she seemed to have at every waking moment. Oh yes Todoroki-san, please. Shoto nodded, dropping into the offered seat and letting himself be absorbed by the fight like his peers. Speaking truthfully, the son of the number two hero never really saw the student, Ibarra according to the Jumbotron, like anything worth writing home about. Yet here, in front of everyone, she was giving the supposed ace more trouble than his last two fights by a wide margin. His webbing shot off in rapid fire, trying to pierce the defenses of his opponent a rather base approach, but he had little options given the nature of his opponent's quirk. Parker's out of his element. Shoto looked over at Bakugo of all people being the one to make the distinction. The man didn't even blink as he observed the fight. Reasonable, given that the victor would face him in the next round. He had several patches and bandages strewn around his form. Oh come on, Ace is just trying to get his footing is all, Kirishima argued, looking over to the frowning blonde. Idiot, Bakugo grumbled, since when have you ever seen that guy stand his ground in a fight? He's like Frogface, always jumping around and dodging, sticking to walls and crap to get a better angle. Open spaces with nowhere to climb, no overhang for him to swing, and the vine chick is just eating up anything that's left. The rest of their peers tried to voice an argument, but even through the momentary silence of the crowd, there was nothing. Hiroshima bit his lip, looking back at the arena with a worried expression. So is Ace gonna lose here? He might, Bakugo shrugged. The guy is playing the world's hardest game of keep away from all sides. Jiru grumbled from her seat, don't see you doing that. Whatever you wanna say, doesn't stop me from being right. The punk girl looked ready to point a certain finger at Bakugo, but she stopped as a crash echoed through the stadium. Parker was, ripping the arena apart. Okay, Shizaki was giving him no other choice. If she wanted to tear apart the arena, then two can play at that game. He ducked to avoid more vine surges and leapt into the air, twisting as he aimed a web line back at the ground and pulled as hard as he could. He flew down, fist reared back, and Peter crashed down into the arena. He struck the already damaged ground with a mighty impact, forcing a massive cloud of debris and dust into the air as if a missile had struck there. The winds from the resulting shockwave made the onslaught of vines pause. Peter hopped into his own self-made crater, finding a perfect spot to grab. A vine lashed out from under him, but he pulled down, cutting off the attack before he started to lift. In his hands, the giant slab of jagged stone from the ruined concrete rose as the audience gasped and awed at the sight. He saw even Shizaki's eyes widen and with a roar, Peter chucked it, sending the giant slab of concrete careening towards the green-haired girl. He jumped up, tingle roaring as he felt vines underground sprout out from where he once was. She grit her teeth, and like a wave, green vines surged out from around the arena to wrap around the giant chunk of stone. Even vines that were positioned around her person were used to defend her. Peter dashed forward, dust exploding behind him as he leapt through her stymied defenses, and Shizaki's eyes widened even further as he appeared before her, practically in an instant. Sorry, he muttered, rearing his left hand back and his fist caught her cheek as the vines were too late to intervene. The girl flew off her feet, the vines following suit as she rolled on her massive green, 
barely avoiding falling out of bounds herself. Then like a giant sea of serpents, the vines coiled around her body. Peter's eyes widened as he stood on what little concrete was left on his side of the arena, and the vines were quickly formed into a giant sphere. And now I need my fedora, Peter mused, seeing the similar shape in how she got in the top ten during the first event. That she needed to see, right. The vines were wrapped around it, looking like those rubber band balls. Tingle, green serpents surged out in a frontal direction as Peter jumped, dust kicking off as the plants formed an impenetrable wall of green. The sphere of vines was coiling and writhing as Peter landed. He turned around, eyes scanning the massive sphere. No openings. Then the vines from behind surged in his direction like a massive horde of snakes. Peter took off in a sprint, and the mass of serpents gave chase. He could even see the vines from that frontal surge retreating. And the ball looked weaker, so she has to use vines for the frontal assault, sacrificing defense for offense. He skidded, and felt tremors again before he jumped high, avoiding the mass of vines that erupted beneath him. As he flipped in the air, he saw the plants from his previous side of the arena converge to form a massive tendril. The sphere began to move, the giant tendril moving as one as it began to swing around the arena, and Peter was in its path. He fired a web line to the ground, pulling down and avoiding the oversized yet ironic weed whacker. He panted upon seeing the giant tendril come back for another pass as the sphere that contained Shizaki was moving. Another tingle again and Peter cursed as he leapt, avoiding the ground being torn asunder as another massive tendril made the arena crack and shatter. Now she had two massive RV-sized tendril arms, one going high in a turn, the other sweeping low. Peter had his arms up, blocking the strike from the massive vines as he was sent to the ground with a thud. He coughed, not phased before the next tendril swiped at him, hurling him across the arena like how a hand would shove dust off of a tabletop. Peter rolled and yelled, unable to escape as the vines wrapped around his legs and arms as he struggled and writhed. Then he saw an incoming chunk of raised debris and brought his hands up. He went through the giant car-sized piece of debris and got slammed by a mass of tendrils from on high, causing debris and dust to fly into the air. Deep within her sphere, Ibarra panted as she braced herself on her knees, rubbing her jaw carefully. That strike Parker had landed was pretty good. His speed was unreal, as if he had copied it as technique he used against Parker in the tiebreaker fight. It had made her dizzy, forcing her to utilize all of her vines to form the boulder from before, and draw on more sunlight with her countless holes from the outside. Holes and slits were formed and quickly vanished thanks to her constant concentration in order to keep her vine barrier up. She was unable to hear or see him, but she could feel his movements via the vines she had coursing under the concrete. She climbed to her feet, a slit in her giant sphere opening so she could see where her two tendrils had converged on. Did I get him? She pondered aloud, before she felt slashing going around in her vines. Her eyes widened as her tendrils shook and moved aside. To the delight of a surprised crowd, Peter Parker emerged and jumped high in the air with his shirt and pants in tatters, bruises and cuts evident. In his hands was an iron bar that had been pulled from the grid underneath the arena, and further slowing him down was a giant piece of rubble in his other hand. Parker twirled in mid-air, firing the rubble like a shot put. Shizaki raised her arms, vines converging to block it as the jagged piece of rubble tore through them but losing its speed in the process. She immediately felt more of her long vine hair get cut off. She winced, opening a direct hole from above to let the high-rising sun in. The more sunlight she had, the longer she could keep her onslaught coming. She could focus on drinking plenty of water after the fight. Peter ran, charging with his iron rod as vines surged out. He was twirling, firing web bullets whenever possible to tie them together as he swung hard. He landed on the dirt and debris of the destroyed arena. His weapon was blunt, so to compensate, he had to put more power and speed into his swings. Peter jumped and sidestepped, lashing out at vines as he leapt, backhand slashing and cutting another sect of the green tendrils. I am at a loss for words. This fight is going as plus ultra as it can go. Shizaki looked K by Parker, only for her to counterattack and is ravaging the entire arena in doing so. And we thought Todoroki gave Cementos a hard time. We may need a new arena by the time this is over. Peter brought down an overhead swing, chlorophyll and green mulch spraying out. He saw the vines only gather and get faster as he ran amongst the debris, and raised stone, avoiding vine surges as he leapt, twirled, and backflipped away from each strike. He got to the top of a raised part of the arena and saw those two massive vine tendrils recoup and rear back. He fired a web line at the sphere and pulled, plunging in as he spun around, yelling as he did so and hacking and twirling like a human weed whacker. The giant vine arms met and got slashed and hacked through as Peter came out of that quagmire, rolling around on the ground covered in green gunk and near the giant vine sphere. 
he spat out plant matter and roared, cutting into the nearby vine sphere as the metal around his hand started to warp around his fingers. Chunks flew out of the ball, but no matter how much Peter carved out, more vines kept appearing to replace or defend the ones that were left. It was like trying to empty a pool with a big bucket. He got some out, but nowhere near enough to make any major headway. All right, I know this is really rich coming from me, but your powers aren't fair. Peter screamed, swiping at an incoming vine and backpedaling as far as he could. He jumped, firing a web line. Vines lashed out in all directions. He contorted his body to dodge them, but some of the tendrils closed in on his legs in the line. Three of them wrapped around his limbs and webbing before pulling sharply, snapping the line and nearly causing Peter to fall face first. His feet stuck to the ground, giving him all the traction he needed to yank them free and sprint like a madman in the other direction. He saw the vines retract, and the giant vine sphere began to move and roll towards him. Walls of green came in from both sides as Shizaki had giant tendrils slammed down beside him. He dodged left and right and began running around the arena. Not even debris was spared as it was grabbed and tossed out of the way. A huge ball of green that he couldn't stop coming in from behind him and only the brazier in front of him were left. A stupid idea formed in his brain, and he prayed that it would work. He jumped, trusting the soles of his feet to stick on the edge of the arena near the brazier as he about faced, ran up said brazier, and jumped over the incoming vine boulder. He flipped through the air, over the ball, and as he shot overhead, he saw an opening. Shizaki was in the middle of a non-moving patch of vines and on her knees, eyes widening in shock but she wasn't fast enough to prevent Peter from firing one good web shot in. It hit the side of her face, but even as Peter landed on the other side, skipping over the patches of concrete in the vine ocean, he knew it wasn't enough. He had only taken out her depth perception, and after that little stunt, only about a fifth of the arena's concrete was left. Ironically, said stone formed the portion of the arena that Shizaki had started off on. A quick flick of his wrists, and Peter winced as he saw his remaining ammunition. Almost out of fluid, one or two big lines were all that he had left. None would be left for him. But options, what did he have? Plenty of rocks to throw, not much space left to run in. He still had the metal bar, but attacking head-on would only drain him if he didn't have a good way to capitalize on it. Come on, what was left, what was left? He blinked, and an idea hit him harder than any of those vines could. Peter dropped the metal rod, throwing out the last two lines of webbing that his shooters could grant him, sticking them to the tops of the two nearest braziers. Here comes S-H-I-O-Z-A-K-I. And OHHH. -H. What's Parker doing now? Shizaki is rolling in. Shizaki's bus sized ball turned around with her vines now coming towards him in all directions. Peter pulled hard with a mighty grunt of effort, using every ounce of superhuman muscle he had to give him a chance at victory. The concrete cracked under his feet, and then everyone in the stadium heard the crack. Shizaki's ball slowed and the stadium was speechless as with a roar. Peter brought the brazier towers down from the corners of the arena closest to the American. The arena shook as both towers collapsed onto the ground on either side of him. Gas systems continued to do their job, letting the huge bowls of fire light up the stadium and the arena. And like a pair of giant twin flails used by Greek warriors of old, he slammed the giant braziers to the ground near Shizaki's vine boulder. It and the tower it was connected to setting parts of the arena aflame. And every piece of green with it, dozens of vines caught fire and Peter could see Shizaki even sacrificing the ones that formed her ball to keep the flames at bay, many of them retracting. So removing those vines by force didn't hurt much, yet burning did. Or was she averse to it? Peter didn't know. A huge mass of vines formed up in an effort to smother one of the fires, but Peter grabbed hold of a concrete chunk and threw it like he was practicing his fastball. And he didn't stop at one. Vines were cut or pummeled into non-existence as Peter did everything he could. His hands grabbed and threw, he even kicked like a soccer player with anything that could stick to his feet. Foot by foot, throw by throw, more vines got pelted and the massive ball was getting more and more torn apart as the flames spread. Even debris that got destroyed by his kicks pelted the boulder like buckshot from a shotgun or medieval cannon. Now, Peter charged in a sprint, avoiding the vines on the ground as he took a mighty leap. His arms wide and one leg curled back as he saw the larger hole at the top of the boulder. He managed to land inside the giant vine sphere, right behind a standing Shizaki who turned, utterly stunned. She threw out her hand, and Peter slid along the ground, vines passing overhead. He kicked off the ground as another vine tried to grab him from below. Peter flipped over Shizaki and swung the pipe that he had reclaimed after ceasing his projectile assault cutting straight through Ibarra's hair that was forming the giant vine and was the metaphorical head to this thousand-head hydra. She yelled in surprise and a bit of pain as her long green locks were torn, 
and the giant vine ball crumpled without her control. He put a hand on the back of her shirt, picking her up and throwing her like some odd football. She burst through a weakened part of her vines, yelling as she landed on the ground and rolled to a stop. The greenette got back to her knees when she turned, face set in dire determination. His arms felt like a lead weight, and there was barely any power in them. As her hair began to grow back, vines coiling like a gorgon's hair, Peter fell to his knees, and he heard the crack of a whip and the sound of the horn. Shizaki gasped and looked behind her, seeing that her foot was out of bounds on the grass. Shizaki Ibarra has gone out of bounds. The victor is Peter Parker of Class 1A, Midnight declared. The arena erupted in a cacophony of noise that nearly deafened Peter. He tried to wave, but he was too tired, and the heat from the fires was starting to get to him. He heard a crash, and saw that giant hands of concrete were rising up to smother the flames thanks to Cementos. This sports festival just keeps one-upping itself. What an amazing fight. Guess we needed a new arena after all. Both Parker and Shizaki threw everything and the kitchen sink at each other. Mark my words folks, this play and match will be talked about for a long time. Present Mike raved over the cheer of the crowd. M-U-M-M-Y-C-A-W-A. -M -M your thoughts, Shizaki did an outstanding job with crowd control and defense, and her overwhelming firepower with her quirk was nothing short of impressive. However, no suit of armor is invincible, and sadly for her, Parker found the weak spot, considering how Shizaki needs sunlight in order to make the most of her quirk. Aizawa mused. For Parker, well, what else needs to be said at this point? Peter breathed a sigh of relief. It was over, thank God. He grunted as he got to his feet, his shirt and pants darkened by the chlorophyll from Shizaki's hair vines. Yet Shizaki Ibarra herself, for all her angelic beauty, only had a few scratches on her. He panted as he walked up to her, seeing her sigh. Hey, he breathed, offering his hand to her. The girl perked up upon seeing it. Then Peter bowed in respect. He raised his head and saw Shizaki return it in kind. They rose back up, and they shook hands. You kicked my ass out there. He laughed, smiling a bit. I was only doing my best to defeat you as painlessly as possible, although it is unfortunate I lost so. Shizaki perked up as Peter raised her hand over his head, and the crowd roared. The greenette offered a soft smile in return. And it seems you've gained quite an audience in our duel, Parker. She commented, pointing up at the jumbotron as Peter turned. The social media feed was scrolling so fast that he couldn't keep track of the names. In addition, there were the chants, Parker, 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 Parker. Over and over the audience cheered, and Peter let out a soft laugh. Everyone cheering for his name like this. It felt nice, rejuvenating. Just, soak it in. It was what Mr. Stark would do after all. Or any Avenger as he smiled confidently. That's right, he was an Avenger. The last Avenger. Peter looked to the ground at that thought, frowning. A fine match you too, albeit a bit rough, don't you think? Cementus broke the moment as he approached. One I will certainly remember for a time. However, I must repair the arena and it will take a while. Sorry Mr. Cementus. Peter grinned widely, putting aside the gnawing in his chest. Yes we did go a bit far, right Shizaki? This is All Might's alma mater of UA. She replied taciturnly. We only went plus ultra after all. Um, yeah. Peter thrust his hand in the air. Plus Ultra, haha. -ha. The crowd erupted in a plus ultra roar and it caught Peter off guard as if he felt goosebumps. Chuckles rang out from the audience, and even the cement man had a wide grin. Ah, the vitality of youth. Go take a shower and recover in the locker room, Parker. You'll find a new set of clothes to wear for your final bout. Shizaki, he turned towards her, and the vine-haired girl bowed lightly, and Peter could see her hair growing back to normal. I will rejoin my classmates, Sensei. She let out a sigh. After I hydrate, she began to walk through the debris and jagged concrete as Peter followed. Parker, she murmured, her eyes, Peter suppressing a wince as one was still covered by his webbing, turning towards him as he stepped up by her side. She looked to the side towards her suite. Her class was cheering and waving, mostly as Peter followed her gaze. Pony was there as well, but with bandages and patches as she waved and cheered. Peter grinned widely. Sorry for, well, cutting off your hair. Had to win and what not. You weren't hurting too much, were you? He asked, to which Shizaki shook her head. Cutting off my vines caused me no discomfort. As long as I have sunlight and water I can regrow my hair just fine. Although I could sense the fire. Shizaki looked over at the ruined braziers with a frown. Clever stratagem I must say. Yeah well, you were super strong Shizaki, heck, stronger than me. Didn't have much a choice. Peter mused as they began to walk out of the arena. You're too gracious. Shizaki closed her eyes, smiling lightly. I can see why Pony looks up to you, and for that I thank you. 
H. How so? I mean, care to elaborate? Peter asked, scratching his cheek lightly as his arms throbbed lightly. Pony has been training hard ever since coming here to UA. The green-haired girl explained, always asking Vlad Sensei for access to the training grounds. She only doubled down after the USJ incident, and it motivated some of us in our class. I had to train hard over the past week to get my vines to the level of control I have now. The angel-like girl turned towards him. You beat me fair and square and with honor, and for that I wish you good luck. So I trust you'll know what's coming next, she added, Peter seeing the waves from his own group suite. Todoroki was back, sitting close to Momo and Kayoka. Midoriya was back too, with a crutch and sporting a few bandages. Bakugo was in his seat, and Peter's brown eyes could see the hard simmering ruby gaze the blonde was giving him. Thanks, Peter's face hardened as he looked up at the Jumbotron. And yeah, I know. He spoke in a low tone. Shizaki made no comment. The two walked into the tunnel, going their separate ways. Would you look at that? Hiroshima declared. You had me worried about nothing, Bakugo. The red-headed brawler clapped the blonde on the back, making Bakugo's eye twitch, but he said nothing. Huh, normally Bakugo would be all over something like that. Looks like he's really focused on his next match. Whatever it was, Kayoka couldn't make a good guess. Kai might be a raging maniac sometimes, but there was no one more focused on the match in front of them than he was. Aside from Momo that is, he was going to lose. Asui pointed out, if the braziers weren't there, he wouldn't have been able to slow down the vines long enough to get into that ball of hers. Oh come on. Didn't you guys see that jump of his? I don't think anyone else could have pulled that off. Hiroshima says, flashing a toothy grin. I'm just worried about his inbox, Shoji said from one of his arm mouths sitting behind most of the group. The top two always get the most recruitment offers, and Parker had already made a showing before that match. A few seats over, Bakugo scoffed. You extras are acting like he's the only one in this tournament. Oh don't worry, I don't think anyone could forget you, Kaminari smirked, leaning back in his chair. Don't think that's possible since we have ears, Ciro added with a cheeky grin. What does that supposed to mean? Bakugo roared, baring his teeth. The two dunderheads laughed their asses off as Bakugo tried to force his way past a nervous Kirishima. Jiru rolled her eyes, why in the world couldn't people just chill for two seconds? Those two weren't even in the tournament anymore. And Bakugo, hey Bakugo, Kayoka said, and blinked as Bakugo actually stopped his assault on the jokers to glance her way. Shouldn't you be in the locker room or something? The blonde bomber's eyes narrowed, only to drift to the now empty and ruined arena as Cementos got to work. Fine, he grumbled, pushing Kirishima away and walking into the tunnels of the arena. Grumpy guy, Yuraraka commented with a light laugh. He's about to fight in the finals of the festival. Like many great warriors, much weighs on his mind, Takoyami brooded with crossed arms. Kayoka notched an eyebrow, but didn't comment on the statement. Takoyami always had a bit of a strange taste in descriptors. More importantly though, Kayoka glanced at her two classmates right beside her. Neither Todoroki or Momo gave any comment. Hell, neither of them had looked away from the arena since the dual quirk boy showed up. You two doing alright? The question snapped Momo out of her little stupor. The rich girl nodded, why yes, I was just observing. So was everyone else, but not everyone's packing binoculars, Kayoka said with a smirk. Momo glanced down at the offending pair of spectacles, sheepishly setting them down. Shoto on the other hand, I'm thinking. The girls shared a look. About what, Todoroki-san? Momo asked. A single, mismatched eye darted her way. If it was any different for him back then. Okay that was. Cryptic, but Kayoka let it slide. The intense thoughts of the number two hero's son were beyond her and she would be glad if they stayed that way. For now, she flipped through the student forums on her phone, noticing that yet again, the page about the festival had blown up. Well, if it makes you feel any better, plenty of people look interested in you Todoroki, Kayoka said, showing her phone as proof at the social media and forum feeds. The scion of the second greatest hero looked at the phone with as much interest as a coma patient. They're probably because of my father. Kayoka rolled her eyes. Sheesh, could it kill you to think that? I don't know, maybe you put on a good show, and they'd like to take you under their wing. I'd say it's been a rather productive day for all of us, Takoyami said with crossed arms and closed eyes. Speak for yourself, I didn't even get in the tournament. Siro groaned. Behind him, Sato shrugged. Eh, it's not all that it was hyped up to be. Don't taunt me, Siro lamented, pointing at the muscular boy. You at least showed off what you could do, and got a win. I didn't even get a shot in my second match, Sato replied looking down. Oh it wasn't that bad Sato, Yuraraka said. I thought you did pretty good, Asui said. All things considered. The huge boy blinked, nervously scratching his cheek. Oh, thanks guys. Yeah, now that you think about it, I got a few good licks in. 
Can't say the same for others though, Kirishima commented, glancing regretfully over to Momo and Asui. The frog girl shrugged without a care in the world, while the class representative didn't even look bashful. Her eyes clouded over. Kayoka had to jab her with her elbow just to get a reaction. A small shriek emerged that made Toradoki give her a sideways glance, but little else. Why yes, Jiru-san. Just wondering if you're doing okay after your match, the punk girl asked. Momo blinked before waving it off. Oh oh, that was nothing. She laughed before settling down, sighing. Why the class rep wasn't as talkative now was odd. A, hey, probably just her losing her match. Peter exited the shower, free of the slime of the dead plants that had soaked him before. He looked around the bathroom, finding his towel and beginning to dry off. Letting out a sigh he set aside the towel and found his spare clothes that the arena's staff had provided him prior to entering the showers. He finished getting dressed and walked into the normal locker room, exiting the men's bathroom and showers. Peter looked up to the TV, seeing Cementos still working on creating a new arena. Sighing. He went over to his locker and looked at his web shooters. The fluid cartridges were dry, so that would mean he would be fighting back Hugo without one of his preferred tools. Oh well. He shut the locker before going over to a table and sitting down. Peter looked at his interlocked hands, thinking on what he had to do next. Bakugo Katsuki was someone who had a lot of firepower with his explosions, but they only seemed to form from his hands. Without his webbing, he couldn't fight from a distance. Looking at the TV, he saw the highlights of his bout with Shizaki. Sipping some water from his thermos, he watched how he ran, jumped, hacked, and slashed away at the thousands of vines going his way. The fact that Shizaki had successfully pushed him into a corner was something else. He hadn't expected her to do that and... Come. The slam of a door broke his train of thought as he turned, and lo and behold, a confused Bakugo Katsuki was in the doorway. Boot raised after kicking the door open. Peter clenched his jaw, breathing through his nostrils. Door has a handle you know, he muttered, picking up his water bottle and sipping. Huh? Why are you here? He looked at the door. Wait a minute, crap this is room two. Can't even read now. Peter muttered under his breath. He felt his tingle act up as he lifted his bottle to sip. I can understand you, Parker. Back Hugo barked in English, slamming his hand against the wall as a pop came out and Peter looked up, glaring at the snarling blonde. Ah, he must have spoken in English. Don't you need to prepare or something? Peter asked in Japanese as he continued to sit, facing Back Hugo as the two boys were by themselves in the room. I've had more than enough. And you, he hissed, red eyes blazing. I can't stand you. The feeling is mutual. Peter spoke low as he looked up at him. You're an eyesore, and for the life of me I can't figure something out. What exactly? Back Hugo asked, willing to indulge him. For starters, for someone as thuggish as you, why the hell does Midoriya still look to you as a friend with his little pet name? The American asked, sipping his water as Back Hugo raised an eyebrow. Then he began to look angry, a very pained angry, as he bared his teeth. Who cares about that fucking nerd? He snapped, getting closer with every stomp of his boots. Peter rose to his feet, realizing that he had Bakugo by an inch or two. Deku has nothing to do with this. And, and secondly, Peter spoke low. Tell me. He looked back at Bakugo. You want to be a hero, so you can be like All Might, correct? Nothing else. He remembered, back on that elevator. Bakugo wanted to be number one. Like All Might, no matter who was in his way. Of course, that's my end game goal. Bakugo sneered. All of us here want to be like All Might. To go plus ultra. You. He pointed, jabbing a finger at the brown-haired boy's chest. All you care about is some stupid ass speech and sacrifices and making stupid cornball jokes when you should be taking this seriously. A hero who wins is the only thing that matters. He swung his arm to the side. Everything else is shit on the roadside. Real heroes don't lose, or else they're just trash. He shouted before turning and marching out of the room and towards his own, not before slamming the door on his way out. Peter felt himself go perfectly still. Everything that Bakugo had said was just more of the stupid bullshit. More of his own overinflated opinion of his own goddamn importance that meant nothing. Jack. Shit. Nothing. But those last words. It was like a gunshot going off in his brain. An unbelievably deafening roar that made colors dance behind his eyes and a flood of memories pour through the bleeding wound. His hands twitched. Real heroes don't lose. He muttered slowly in Japanese. You say. Feeling the breath huff out of his nostrils as his fists slowly clenched. Opened and clenched again. So Pony, Midori, Momo, the Guardians, Doctor Strange, Mr. Stark, Uncle Ben. So they weren't heroes to this. Thug. They didn't pass his standards, huh? It shouldn't matter. He shouldn't care. Back Hugo was an ass and his opinion wasn't worth a damn to begin with. And yet, the thought sickened him. Right down to his core. A hero in training. Bakugo Katsuki, all he wanted was victory, no matter the cost. 
That was all he cared about, all that mattered to him. Peter sat down in his locker room, trying desperately to calm down as the words bounced around his skull, his anger mounting all the while. The sound of a crunching water bottle, which was the thermos in his hand, permeated throughout the silent locker room. We are here at last, the cream de la cream of UA, as freshmen will be decided. Present Mike shouted as Parker and Katsuki walked side by side to the arena. Parker's face was like a rock, set and unmoving. Katsuki, he couldn't wait for the opening bell, his grin filled with devilish delight. Finally, after so damn long, he and Parker head to head. No suit, no gear, as equal as it gets. He would be the one to show the world that he was the one closest to becoming number one. Not this quipping clown. The final match, Peter Parker and Bakugo Katsuki of Class 1A. These two got the top two scores in the entrance exam to apply here. You can say that fate had these two clashing from the very start. Number one versus number two. I'm not gonna be number two for long, not anymore. Katsuki thought to himself. His red eyes were wide with excitement. Everyone will be singing Emma praises, not yours. Parker took his spot in the arena, and Katsuki his, and it was then the blonde noticed that Parker's wrists were bare. What, did your toys break while fighting Vinegirl? He asked with a smirk. Parker was silent. The blonde's eye twitched. Silent treatment. Katsuki smirked. Eh, good mindset then. Not that it'll do you any good in our fight. What? Too angry to even speak. He then switched to English. Cat got your tongue. Parker's lip twitched as he glared, unblinkingly, and Katsuki felt a chill as he looked at him with disgust. No, it was anger. So, what is it? Katsuki laughed, baring his teeth as tiny pops exited his hands, still in English. When was it that we hated each other? Or when you finally paid me attention? Katsuki's mind rummaged through his observations of the many extras. As he saw the highlights of the prior matches, he saw his clash against Horn Girl. Suno dot 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 tri was it? Or was it Tori? He didn't pay attention. The way Parker was glaring at him, not focusing on those extras back in their suite or the chanting crowd. He could even hear the Parker chants again, and Katsuki's blood began to boil. The masses would be cheering for him before long. So, you're mad because I beat up your friend, is it? Katsuki asked in Japanese. Parker stretched his arm, breathing hard through his nose as he stayed silent. Well let me say it right here and now. You're not giving her the respect she deserves. Come again. The American's eyes were like steel as he cracked his knuckles, his words low as he answered. Oh yes, he is mad. But now, Katsuki felt. Slighted. Horn girl nearly beat me in the fight. Hell, she's the closest one I've ever fought who came close to beating me. And you, you probably think she's some precious little doll for you to protect. Well get your eyes checked and your brain examined you fucking idiot. Katsuki snarled. You're looking down on her by thinking she's fragile. Well, he stretched his neck out. She's not. So if you're gonna come at me, then go ahead, white knight, he added that in English. And fight for yourself. Don't fight to avenge her. To avenge a loser. Parker's eyes widened, and the blonde felt a chill through his spine as Parker began to scratch the side of his head, as if he had a slowly growing itch. Katsuki gulped in anticipation, licking his lips before the devil's grin came forth. That's it Parker. Hate him. He thought darkly to himself. Hate me with everything you've got. You've always been the one ahead of me. The strongest of us in our generation. I understand that. But, I will be the one to overtake you. Come at me with all of your hate, then I know you'll be fighting me without holding back. And when I win, he thought, I'll be number one. Undisputed. Without any doubt. Just like the old days back in Alderna. Back before this stupid school year began. Everything will be brought back to normal, with me at the top. Because the one who will win here, when all is said and done. Katsuki dropped his grin, growing a scowl will be me. No. Parker stopped his scratching of his crown, looking at him with a dismissive scowl as he spoke in his native tongue. You won't. Too angry to even speak Japanese. Katsuki scoffed. Now then, are both fighters ready? Midnight called out. Katsuki bent down, arms bent and hands ready to unleash turbo speed as he went over his strategies on how to best Parker going off of his previous fights. His hands crackled with red pops. Parker bent down low as well, one hand to the ground and legs wide as he supported himself from the balls of his feet and his fingertips. Katsuki did his best to calm the explosions in his palms, ready to launch forward like a fighter jet. Finally, Katsuki felt like a kid on Christmas morning as he focused, shedding his smile for a glare to return towards Parker. This is one-on-one -on -one versus Peter Parker, and the road to the top was through him. It was time to toss him from that ivory tower. The moment I've been waiting for. They lifted their heads, dark steel brown into burning ruby red as Katsuki found himself unable to hear the roar of the crowd. Parker didn't either, and Katsuki knew that gaze, for it mirrored his own. 
They had one goal, and they had the power to act on it. Victory. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 11. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.